how you doing? This is John, and welcome to John's Log Box. Uh, I'm here with just Kevin Ryan. Um, unfortunately, I just found out, Kevin just posted on Twitter that, that Keith Geffen died, and I was just about to go to bed. Now I'm like, you know, sadly, you know, adrenaline, I guess, going through. So I, I, I messaged Kevin, and he agreed to come on. We're going to talk live about what Keith Geffen meant to us. Hello, Kevin. Hey, how you doing? Well, I'm glad to finally talk to you, and I'm sad that these are the circumstances that we're, that we're talking. It happens more and more. A lot of these guys that we love have been working for 50 years on comics, and it's bound to happen. Yes. Uh, for those of you who are wondering who Kevin is, Kevin, why don't you introduce yourself? Oh, geez. I'm, uh, I'm a little nothing. I'm just Kevin <laughs> Ryan. That explains the name. Um, I'm a 50-year comic collector. I've been collecting comics since 1972. Um, I got involved with the whole Comicsgate thing about four or five years ago. I haven't put together a campaign as yet. Maybe the future will hold something. Yeah. But uh, no, I just I'm just a, a nerd encyclopedia. So here I am. Yeah, Ke Kevin. Kevin and I have been talking and private messaging each other. He, uh, I I want him to come on my my channel, but uh, I, I I I'm this is gonna sound pretentious, and I don't mean it to sound pretentious, but I'm kind of like packed to the gills with people like messaging me and uh, if, if you have a campaign i kind of put you at the forefront because i, I want to help people sell some comics so sure so i ho hope kevin doesn't get his feelings hurt no. but we're here now talking so first and foremost let's let's talk about keith giffen uh wh where did you I, I i saw that you posted it and then like right underneath i saw colleen duran another yep. creator that i absolutely love posted up a, a, a memorandum of, of of kevin keith giffen pictures so I'm, I'm i'm really sad because I I, yeah. I I dug his work Again, I, I, talk for 10 minutes. I i started looking through twitter to see you know if this i wanted to make sure that this was real before i right 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 it. i've been fooled before here yeah. and it turns out that mike had just started a twitter account he had literally put up eight posts and um i don't know if you saw that he um he had written his own epitaph oh wow did i, I don't know if you you noticed that no but he, he what he wrote was i swear to god i i did not write this this is keith wrote this he wrote i told them i was sick anything not to go to new york comic con thanks keith giffen wah ha 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 uh, he, he, yeah I, I i never met the man i i yep. only know him through his work i i to, to be honest i didn't even know what he looked like until i saw colleen duran's uh, pictures of him and uh i i, I kind of knew he was a funny guy so i mean that's yeah that's, yeah, yeah. That, that's a that's funny in a morbid way but mm -hmm. uh first off i i want to say uh thank you smiling magician it's it's lovely to see uh new faces unfortunately this is the circumstance yeah well if if you're a comic book fan for i don't know any amount of time i, I don't want to put a number on it then then, then you're a fan of, of, of keith giffen's work dale thank you for showing up yeah i know and uh traffic patrick i i i feel morbid taking two dollars but yes i love this trencher series that he did for image you know I, I'm, I'm not making a live stream to get anybody's money, but I appreciate it. Travis Patrick again. Thank you. Yeah. Rip. I, I, I first was aware of him. Jeez. I, before I even was aware of him, if that makes sense, I was a little kid collected Legion of superheroes. And I yep. just remember my, my friend, Mike was, was busting my chops that I wasn't reading Legion of superheroes. And I was like, bouncing boy, lightning lad, karate kid. You know, I was making fun of the names and he was like, yeah, the names are silly. Get over it. And I got to thank Mike. He steered me, and I've been a lifelong Legion of Superhero fans ever since. And for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, Keith Giffen was was the artist at, at this point. Yep, he was apparently he was 70 years old, and he okay. um, he quite likely passed away from COVID because oh, he okay. he himself posted last week that in between moving and COVID, it has just about done me in. That is another quote from Keith as of last week, or maybe about a month ago. So okay. I, I have the feeling he was getting over complications of COVID. I don't know. I, I wasn't friends with him, but that's my understanding from what I read off of his Twitter. Oh, okay. All right. All right. Jeez. Well, I mean, it's good to know the details, but, you know, yep. I, I don't know what to say, guys. I, I, I'm not good in these circumstances. I just wanted, I just wanted to uh, express my, uh, my, my love for the guy's work, you know. Sure. Comic well, book I mean, Go ahead, I'm John, sorry. John, as you can tell, I'm Irish. Um, yeah, me too. And, and the Irish, the, 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 you know, you go to the Irish funeral and, and you know, there's just one less drunk. That's the difference. Yeah. So we don't get super upset. We celebrate the life of the person rather than getting overwhelmed with it. Uh, right. so it I mean, obviously, it's, it's, a, it's a terrible thing that this has happened. 
Um, but you know, Keith gave us a lot of great work over the years. So I mean, yep. that's why we're 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 celebrating his life at this point. Yep. Um, I, I always say that to my wife when she tells me somebody passed on. I go, "How old were they?" But I, I always put the uh, the qualifier eighty, like the the because my dad died at seventy two, and I I thought that was too young. So I always say like, once you hit eighty, it's like and you die, like we celebrate your life. You know, if you're below eighty, we I, I kind of mourn. You know, so yep. Yeah, I yeah, know. So, so when I, when I was a kid, we had a, I grew up in Vermont and okay. we had a, we had a local department store up there um, that had its, uh, every section of the store was rented by a different company. So one company would have the furniture, one company had the clothes and one company had the toys and in the toy department, they had magazine three uh, comic book, three packs, all the kids, nobody was watching it. Everybody would rip them open. And so you had stacks of comics that were months and months old that were still sitting there. And among it was Defenders 48 and 52, which were Keith Giffen books. You ever read those? I I, I, ha- I read every Defenders comic, but I, 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 I'm I I going to say I can't differentiate which those particular issues were. Nick Fury's brother, the Zodiac. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. And they also yeah. had the Marvel Spotlight with Moon Knight with the giant chessboard. Yep. And all those were Keith Giffen books back when he started – and uh, was trying to emulate Jack Kirby and was doing a, a hell of a job. Um, and so I, I was a Keith Giffen fan because I bought those almost new. So we're talking 77. So I've always loved Keith Giffen stuff. And then when he came aboard Legion, well, wow. You know, yeah. the book had just come out of a kind of a weak period. I don't I think Pat Broderick did some of the stuff and I Dick Giordano that. worked on it. But it was compared to what had gone before, it wasn't quite as strong. And then Keith Giffen came aboard, and within only a few issues, he launched into the Great Darkness saga. Yeah, with, uh, up against Dark Side. Wow. That was one of my first comics that I did on my channel. Was was uh, the, the Great Darkness saga? Mm-hmm. You know, and what 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 year was that? I, my my mind is blanking on the year. That was like <clears throat> nineteen eighty two. Nineteen eighty two, and. Oh my God, that's 20, forty years ago. Forty and, years ago, yeah. And that, to me, the the Legion has has never peaked since. That that was the peak of the Legion. Yep, absolutely. And I mean, that was one of the peaks of comic books, 1982, 83, You know. Yep, they brought back <laughs> Superboy, Supergirl, and of course, as soon as you saw it was Dark Side, you're like, uh oh, we're in trouble now. Right, and I was trying to express that to people in my in my, in my video that th- that was because nowadays Dark Side seems to show up every third issue of anybody's comic book. Like like he he. At one point, you know, Jack Kirby created Dark Side, and I'm sure you know all the details better than me. And uh, when Jack Kirby left DC to go back to Marvel, they kind of didn't take out Jack Kirby's toys anymore, so Dark Side kind of disappeared. And and then when they showed Dark Side as as the bad guy, that was a big shocking reveal. You know, that was you turn that page and you saw that it was Dark Side. You're like, you know look at this. Oh my, it was exciting. You know, well, for, for people that don't know the story, hello, Dr. Mask, retro elixir. Yep. Um, for those who don't know the story, uh, these, these creatures start showing up, these strange shadow creatures and they look sort of familiar and you're like, wait a minute, that kind of looks like, uh, and, 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 but you didn't, one of them looked sort of like Superman. Another one looked like Orion of the new gods and they were going after artifacts of power. Like, right. um, and some of it was pretty obscure. I, I'm trying to remember who wrote this story. Was was it Paul Levitz? Yeah, my, I think it was Paul Levitz. So, you know, somebody that was seeped in the lore. Um, and I remember at one point they were stealing the Mentachem wand, which didn't mean much to me, except then I found out that that's the weather was the thing that the weather wizard uses in Flash back in the 60s. It, who so, was from the future. So it made sense that it would be in the Legion of Superhero time. Yeah, Mentachem uh, probably yeah. is how it was pronounced. Mentachem. And I wasn't going to correct you because I wasn't sure how to pronounce it. <laughs> it's one of the, you know, it's like, is it the submariner or the submariner? I don't know. So, um, I say submariner. Even, oh, God, me too. But when we were kids, God, <laughs> the things we screwed up. So, yeah, we, you fight with people over that fun stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. that's um, really important. It's a magneto. No, it's not. It's a magneto. So oh, like, <clears throat> Batman could beat Spider Man, and then I mean, you you would take out your fist to prove who could win, Batman or Spider, because that was important back then. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, so so these these creatures start showing up, and the Legion has to go after them, and they're really they're, they're befuddled, 
And then out of a some, it might have been out of a boom tube. Dark side shows up, and he's gonna he's gonna take over the planet Daxam, so we can yep. get six billion Supermen working for him. Yeah, <laughs> this, was, this was Shakespeare. Yep. You know, this 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 was comic books at at its its superpowers. You know. And the artwork was just, so he, he had refined his art style, so he was no longer copying Kirby, right. but he had not yet gotten to the point where he was, because he got to a point in his later run of Legion where the stuff was a little abstract. Yeah, I I, I have to say, uh, by the time Keith Giffen was doing uh, the deluxe comics uh, Thunder Agents, mm -hmm. I hated his artwork so much that, that I didn't read his lightning stories. I read everything else in the comic, but I hated his artwork so much. I didn't even read them until I just now, because I, I, I finally finished off my Thunder Agents collection, reread all the Thunder Agents comics from number one to, to now. And so I've had these comics since they came out in 1984 and, or, or 86 rather. And I just finally read the Keith Giffen section. So this was a guy whose art I absolutely loved at one point in my life. And then at another point, his art was a deterrent for me to read. You know, did you go on with Legion uh, when Keith was working on it? Did you go on to the deluxe book? Yes, I did. OK, that first story with the Legion of Supervillains, was that um, was that Giffen? The, the first I, I the deluxe book started with Giffen. And then I think if I remember correctly, it went very quickly to Steve Leahy. Is that how you pronounce his name? Um, possibly. Yes. Yeah. Uh, um, I, I, for the life of me without, without going and getting the comics, I can't remember the exact change off and like he was an excellent replacement too. I, his, his, his stuff was so good. Oh, he was good. But I, I'll tell you something else. My first exposure to the Legion, I, I kind of have to horse you around to this, but my first exposure to the Legion was, um, a story where they were having Brainiac five's birthday party. And they were all toasting him with Kono juice. <laughs> and um, they found at the bottom of the Kono juice, they'd been poisoned oh. with some super Karari that was going to kill them in 48 hours. And so they all went to spend their last 48 hours doing something important. Superboy went home to his parents and Duo Damsel went to her parents, both of her. And, well, Brainiac tried to work on the cure. And Karate Kid went to take out the Fatal Five by himself and he did and then they and so i loved karate kid from that oh, point I, forward. I, can i just address this comment sure Chat? yeah this isn't keith giffen keith giffen died and and, and kevin ryan and i are, are talking about him so I, I i don't want anybody to get the wrong idea no i am not keith giffen this is not keith giffen no no i'm just kevin ryan it says that right under my name yeah so i i i i, I don't want to steal valor or, or anything like that no god no yeah. So, so, um, so the, uh, so then you get to the deluxe Legion with, again, with Paul Levitz and Keith, and that's the story where Karate Kid does not come out well at the end. He's a little crispy <laughs> by the time that story finishes, but that was another powerful story because it had been the first time in over a decade that a Legionnaire didn't quite make it out. Yeah. Yeah. So that, the, that, the, Legion, the Legion had some high stakes. Yep, people actually died. Um, yeah, people actually died. People got arms ripped off. Um, you know, uh, I, I, what, what, what happened to a to a Saturn girl and 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 a Lightning Lad's child? I don't want to spoil it for anybody. Exactly, exactly. Oh my God! You know that was a comic book with 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 everybody had everybody on that team who could could give Superman a run for his money, and and yet you, you think they would solve all the problems very easily. No, yeah. they had very high stakes because I, I think the company wasn't worried about any of the uh, the IP in terms of like tie in oh, licensing. Yeah. So you could you could mangle Legionnaires. Yeah. Keith. Oh, yes. He wrote the Ragman. I, I was oddly fascinated with, with the Ragman and because because I was a Pat Broderick. I, I still am a Pat Broderick fan. Get 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 a Bronze Star by uh, Mike Barron and Pat Broderick. Well, you know, um, it, Keith, you know, was that's the thing. He was not only an artist; he was a heck of a good writer, right? Um, you know, because he went to the, the the Justice League, yep. right? Yep, because I think he was co-plotting that with uh, J.M. D. Matias. Uh, just a little plug for myself: J.M. D. Matias will be on my channel. Oh, uh, okay, all right. Yeah. Yep. So uh, I, I now we have something to talk about. Well, we always had something to talk about, but geez, we'll be definitely be talking about Keith Gifford. And, and I always know, said that J.M. D. Matias, he, he's very spiritual and trippy. And like, like, 
to me, like JMD Matias, like, you know, this is going to sound awfully pretentious, but I'm a complicated guy. I like my superheroes and drag out fist fights, but I also like this spiritual looking for, for things. And I always, JMD Matisse, like from, from Greenberg, the vampire to seekers to, uh, you know, he, he was always like this, I don't know, like ph phil philosophical writer. And then Keith Giffen to me was always superheroes and, and comedy and you stuck them two together and they came up with some of the best comics, like straightforward four color American comics ever. You know what I mean? It was like, get your peanut butter out of my chocolate, get your chocolate right. out of my, Oh my God, there's a Reese's peanut butter cup. You know what we're almost skipping over because it's been sure. forgotten in the, in the annals of time um, is ambush bug. Yeah. Ambush bug. Yeah. Yep. Cause that kind of came out of nowhere. It was like, yeah, one, they, they just, they just dropped it into issues of action comics and Superman here and there. It's Hey John, I saw that Keith was from Queens area. I didn't know that. Do you like any of the comic book artists from the Queens area that you know of? Um, uh, Queens and Brooklyn is overrepresented in, in the comic book field. You know, I mean, how could it not be, you know, comic books were created in New York city, you know, and, and, uh, a lot, a lot of guys who, were it from New York, moved to New York to work in the comic book field. So yeah, I mean, if 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 you gathered a hundred Marvel and DC guys of of talent, put them in a room together and threw a rock, odds are you're going to hit a New Yorker or or, or somebody who moved. Oh to God, New York. yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, where do I start? Where do I end, Anthony? You know, I I don't mean to be evasive, but like, well, Tate, you saw that I I posted uh, the picture that Keith and I got together, which was great. Yeah, you, um, I, I, guys, I just want to say, like, I, I'll, I'll mention a comic book guy's name, and then two seconds later, Keith said to me, uh, Keith, Kevin said to me a picture of him standing next to him. The, the guy, Kevin met Steve Ditko, of all people. I did, I did. Um, that's a whole other topic. But the, um, no, what I did was, I, I remember going on a trip with my mother to New York and looking out over 8th Avenue from the hotel and saying, oh, I'm going to live here someday. And so when I was... Uh, a little under 50, I moved down to New York City. Oh, okay. And, and I started going to con after con after con and went to the Big Apple shows with um, the Mike Carbonaro that you and I and Jimmy Palmiotti were discussing the other night, who yeah. you got to have on your show, except he's insane, and he would not mind me telling you that. Oh, uh, that, that only makes me want to have him on the show even more. He's a world-famous uh, comic dealer, and he runs conventions in New York about every six months. Um uh, really great guy. Well, he he has the attention span of a mosquito, but he knows everybody and manages to put together miraculous conventions. Um, and but Keith specifically, I went. I had to go. I met him over at the um, the East Coast Comic Con in the Meadowlands, and um, he was a nice guy. He was professional. He was quiet that day. Um, so in terms of personal recollection, it was just more of a friendly meeting with him. I mean, it's really with him specifically, I know more from the work, but yeah, he was another New York guy. Cause you go to New York city and, and in so much as these guys are still around. Yeah. It's, it's pretty easy to meet them. If you're in the city, do, do, do you still live in Manhattan? No, no, no. I went back to Vermont. Oh, you live back in Vermont. Yep. How, how did you like your, your time in New York? I loved it. Loved it. Um, what years was this, if you don't mind me oh, asking? Oh, boy. Uh, tw uh, blah, 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 blah. I'm going to say 2013, 14 to 18. Okay. And so I, I was very, I said, I'm going to go meet my heroes. And so among, there were some movie people, TV people, but I got to meet Neil Adams and I got to meet Rich Buckler and I got to meet uh, James Sherman. And Ramona Fredone and, and oh, I, I, I met I met Neil Adams and, and Ramona Fredone. They they were great. Well, Neil was Neil was a pip. Um, he was. I, I met uh, Neil ne twice, and he didn't remember me the second time. I met. The first time he was on, it, it was at a retailer convention. You know, so I, I was working at a comic book store at the time we went, and he was on, so he was pleasant and charming and everything. The second time he was at a convention, and he was just like next. <laughs> No, no, no. He, he, he was never short with me um, in, in that way. Uh, he critiqued me on some things and he, let me use a little bit of PG language here. Uh, he, he was a man of no bullshit. Yeah. But, yeah. but the, but the first time I met him, uh, I'll tell you a quick Neil story. I don't want to lose Keith there, but, but a quick Neil story. The first time I met him, I, I remember seeing him at New York comic con and I said, and I walked up and I, I was, you know, like, what am I, I want this guy. 
ever since I could walk, I know who this guy is. And I said, um, boy, you're Neil Adams. And he looks at me and says, yes, I am. <laughs> and I said, I've been reading your comic books for 40 years. And he says, yes, you have. He says, but if you read this one, and he pulls up a copy of Batman Odyssey. And I knew he'd been going around telling people they should read it as a book. And I, I said, yes, I have. And he goes, but have you read it as a book? And I said, yes, I have. And he sits back in his chair and he straightens his shirt and he says, then you're a good man, Charlie Brown. <laughs> so, um, I mean, read it as a book, as a novel? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Instead of reading it in, in uh, floppy form, pamphlet oh, okay. form, he wanted it read all in one shot. Yeah, I, 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 uh, those those Neil uh, Neil Adam books, uh, I, I, they're kind of out there. So, uh, like he did Dead Man, he did uh, like for the last couple of years of his life, he had like a, a like a deal with DC that they always gave him like a six issue or twelve issue series that was like do whatever you want, Neil. So I I kind of waited till they were done and I read them in one sitting because to me that was the only way to experience them. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, uh, here, Anthony B says, I've heard mixed things about people who met Neil over the years. Yeah, he was indeed super talented. Can't deny that. Yeah. Um, he, he was. And he was trying to help people. But, you know, he had he had five kids of his own and grandkids. And he coached everybody from uh, Frank Miller to yeah. Howard Chaikin. Yep. And so he heard every every bullshit line from everybody ever. And he wasn't having any of it. And I remember he used to be after me to get um, uh, to, to learn how to draw. He was after me to get, um, uh, what do they call it, a light pad. And every time I saw him at a con, he'd be like, oh, did you buy a light pad yet? I said, not I, shortly. He go, and the last time I saw him, he, th he picks up his light pad out of his bag and he throws it at me and he, or he puts it up in my face and he goes, take a picture of this. I want you to get down the brand name because you're going to go out and buy one of these. And you know why you're going to go out and buy one of these? Because it's going to make you a better artist. You hear me, kid? That, that's how Neil was. He was, he was funny. Uh, but he, he's a hell of an artist. He knew what he was doing. And he wanted you to do things correctly. Yep. Yeah, I, the first time I heard about the expanding Earth theories was was that the Fantastic Four comic when the, when John Byrne was kind of goofing on him, and oh, yeah. I, and I, I heard other people tell me that, but that's real. Like I, you know, Neil Neil believed it that the Earth was expanding. Yeah, well, apparently, uh, you know, I, I remember all the people said that he believed that in Hollow Earth and the Earth was expanding. Now people can tell me lots of things. I I don't believe. Have, I don't believe anything people tell me. You know, I'm one of those people. You know, I have to check things out myself. I asked him about it one day, and I caught him on a bad day, I guess. And I said, uh, what can you tell me, Neil? I heard about the growing Earth thing. And Neil goes, it's the expanding Earth. Look it up. I got <laughs> videos out there. And that was all I ever heard about the expanding Earth theory from him. We we'd mostly, we, we talk about art. Okay. And, and so that was, that was the thing with, with Neil and I, but, um, but he, he was, I probably met him about eight or 10 times and wow. he was, he was always very, very helpful. Um, you know, I've heard that he's definitely, if you asked him to critique your art, he would. Um, but if he didn't like it, he would tell you that it sucked. Oh. Don't ask for anything you're afraid to hear the answer to, you know? Yeah. He'd look at, he'd look at some of my drawings and go, what the hell is this? And other things he'd look at it and say, eh, this isn't bad. You keep working. So, um, yeah, but uh, going back to Geffen, if you'd like to, I guess, I don't want to lose too much track. Yeah, yeah, this, it's, yeah, I, I, I yeah. Well, Neil's gone too, unfortunately. Yeah, and, you know, like a lot of other people. Um, we're, we're losing so many. We're losing, you know. I know. The, the uh, you know, you know, so many. I, 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 I got a little emotional. Yeah, you forgive yeah. me. Yeah. Um, and, uh, like, you know, uh, Keith, not only did he come up with uh, um, uh, Ambush Bug, he also came up with Rocket Raccoon. Really? Yeah, it was him and Bill Mantlo in uh, Marvel Preview in, oh. a Hulk, in a Hulk story. Oh, okay. Oh, and i got to check to see if I have that. I, I always thought Rocket Raccoon's first appearance was in a, was in a regular Hulk comic with, with uh, Mike Mignola. I, I guess I'm wrong. 
No, it was, it was Geffen. I, tr I trust you over me when it comes to insane comic book trivia. <laughs> okay. I, I just don't forget anything. That's what, part of the problem. Um, yes, and the heckler. And he also did another comic that, that I absolutely loved called Vexed. He was the god of like bad luck. Huh. Um, it was it, it it I think it only lasts like six I, less than a year. I, I maybe nine issues, but somewhere around there. And I, I loved it. It, it. He was kind of like a doubt. He was like a, a god that nobody heard of. I forget what pantheon he was. Vexed. It, and uh, I'm sure you could find these in a fifty cent bin. I, I I loved it. I thought I, I'm probably the only person that remember. Now I'm going to put it on a showcase in, in honor of uh, of Keith. Well, uh, Keith seemed to have worked on a little bit of everything. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the, the advantages to being behind the scenes here is I'm I'm looking at his uh his bibliography at this moment, so I'm oh, cheating. Good, good, good. Yeah. And uh, he worked on Suicide Squad, he worked on Starman, he worked on Convergence, Claw the Unconquered, Commandy, he worked on uh Thorian of the New Gods, he worked on Weird War Tales. Okay, he, he, he worked on Amazing Adventures. Um the Micronauts, Thanos, Marvel Preview, Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, The Defenders, Excalibur, Howling Commandos. You know, how much more of a resume do you need? Wow. Yeah, he was synonymous with comics. You yep. know, he, you know, back back in the uh, the eighties and nineties, I I don't think there, there probably wasn't a three month period without a Keith Giffen writing, drawing, or or even an editor. I think he was an editor at at, at one point. That, that I don't know much about. You got me into Mobius. Really? Uh, Chris, uh, uh, Kevin, do you mind? I, I sent a couple of invitations out to other people because uh, I figure, you know, we'll, we'll commiserate together. Do you mind if anybody pops in? No, Nobody by all means. I, I just figured I'd ask you first. Sure. No problem. Um, if uh, I've never done this before, Kevin, do you mind if I put a, a, a link to in, in the chat? If anybody in the chat wants to, wants to say something about Keith? Sure. Yeah, bring him in. Okay, let, let's see if this works. I've never done this before. Please, guys, wear clothes, don't play music, and and, and, and no cursing. You know, I I, I don't want to get in trouble with the... If uh, my head starts spinning around, John hit the wrong button. Just yeah, yeah. That in mind. I keep hearing beeping. Is that you, or am I doing that's, something? That's probably me. Unfortunately, uh, that's my alerts from Twitter. Sorry. Okay, okay. That, no problem. No no problem. There, I, I, put, I put the link... I, I don't know if that works or not, but if, if anybody wants to come in, be respectful. You know, we're talking about a, a, we're celebrating a person's life, so uh, you know, you know, I, I, I trust I trust my, my my people. I read a blurb where someone compared the art to Mobius, and that was the first time I've heard it. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Yes, if if you're talking about Trencher, now that you made me think about it, I absolutely agree. I, I wonder if Keith Giffen was doing that on purpose, trying to uh, to, to invoke Mobius. The first time I heard of Mobius was uh, was Frank Miller's Ronin. People were like this guy's ripping off Mobius, and I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, I like Ronin. Let me let me see who Mobius was," you know. So I you know. did I lose you, Kevin? No, no, no. I'm right oh, here. Okay. I just I figured you were finishing something, and in the no, meantime, no, I, all of a sudden you got really, really quiet. I, I thought no, maybe. no, no. I, you you're going to bring people in, and actually, what I was doing was um, was looking up his run on Justice League, uh, trying to refresh myself, seeing if there's anything. Uh, notable that i had forgotten I'm just gonna leave the screen for a second because i have to blow my nose nobody needs to see that nope the yeah, uh I got a little emotional oh yeah. really? okay yeah yeah no i mean um we're losing I, too many of the greats and uh, and uh, as mean as this sounds we're not replacing them with people of of of, of equal or close to equal talent you know like there's always good guys out there. There's always there is always good guys out there, but I'm saying like for every Keith Giffen that we lose, and for every Deal Adams we're losing, like we're gaining a Mags Visaggio. <laughs> you know, well, it's, it's it's not an equal trade. You, you ever heard you ever heard Clark's Law before? Who Clark's Law? No, I have not heard that. Yeah, from Arthur C. Clark. Okay, eighty percent of everything is crap. Oh, okay. I thought that was Sturgeon's Law. Uh, maybe I got my my guys oh, wrong, yeah. but but let's let's roll with the idea. Okay, and, yeah, yeah. and and so there was a lot of, over the years, you know, because I've been reading comics since I could walk, and there's a lot of bad comics out there. And, oh, yeah, and, yeah. and I and got a lot of them back here. <laughs> uh-huh, and, and even stuff that was being put out by Marvel and DC, where you had some conceptual brilliance, but the execution of it, not so good. And so we remember the good stuff. Yes, we do. You know, we remember the stuff that really stands out. Yep. 
And yeah. there's there's stuff that like I, I think is fabulous where you don't really hear too much about it. Um, like you don't hear too many people talking about Jim Aparo anymore. Oh, I love Jim Aparo. I, I've been talking about Jim Aparo. He's my Batman. When I yep. close my eyes and I think of Batman, it's drawn by Jim Aparo. Jim Aparo or Steve Scabies. See, that's that's a name that escapes me. Who, who? Uh, Steve Scabies, I know, worked on the Spectre and Aquaman. And, okay. then the, and then the Submariner back in the 60s and 70s. Okay. And so he was, uh, you don't hear anybody talking about Nelson Bridwell. Yeah, he's a great one, yeah. Or Kurt Schaffenberger or yep. Jim Mooney or Ernie Collan or Shall I Go On? There's a hundred yeah, of these guys. Yeah. Yeah. There we go. It's like eating Lucky Charms. You only remember the marshmallows, yeah. So, yeah. you know, I, I, that one of uh, Mike Carbonaro's conventions in New York, I, I was walking by a table. And there's this guy sitting there sketching. There's nothing on the table. There's no big banner. There's a little name card, little black and white name card. Nobody around them, just sitting there drawing a picture. And I read the name card, and it was James Sherman. You ever heard of James Sherman? No. You remember the Kund War in um, in Legion? Yep. Yep, with Oshtur and the Dark Circle and all that. That yeah. was all James Sherman. Okay. Yeah. You know? And he, and I said, oh my God, you're you know, and he looks up. He says, he smiled. He says, yeah, I'm James Sherman. I, I, but then apparently he got out of comics and he went into commercial advertising. He designed the logo for Shoprite, I think. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, so no, you know, these guys made some contributions outside of comics, and there's thousands of them. I can only hope that some of the kids today are going to come up with stuff that is equally amazing to the stuff that we grew up with. And I think there's a possibility there. This, yeah, there's a possibility. Yeah, I'm I'm not quite as down on current comics. Yeah, that, we were talking of, about that. Yeah, I'm. Uh, yeah, you're you're a little uh, less harsh than I am. Actually, oh. you're, you're a lot less harsh than I am. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, with as many bad comics as I've written right now, what I'm I'm going back through and reading, um, is the uh, the run of Tales to Astonish, the Submariner series. Okay. With uh, done by Stan Lee and um, Gene Collan, using a phony name, he was calling himself like Andy Andrews or something. Yeah, and he was under contract with DC at the time, and he he was working for them, and he wanted to keep working for them, and so he was using a pen name. Right. And I'm reading through the stories, and they stink. <laughs> the the, um, the the art is not great. Uh, the writing is just perfunctory. It's Stan Lee. It is really Stan Lee. And but Namer's going on this great quest for the Trident of Neptune, and all of these great uh, uh, feats that he has to uh, get through to get to the Neptune scepter are just beating up giant monsters, a giant and an octopus, and and Doma is following him around, going, "I love my prince. Why does he not love me?" And I'm like, "Oh, kill me now!" <laughs> so um, uh, so there's a lot of stuff that that we remember as being incredibly good that maybe wasn't the best work they ever well, turned I'm out. Not gonna... I, I don't remember those tales to astonish being that good to begin with. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I also the captain the uh, the original Marvel. The first thirty issues or so are, are forgetful. You exactly. Know? You know, it, it, to me that 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 uh, that Captain Marvel, it everybody kind of reveres him today, and I think what they're remembering is is the, the Jim Starlin period. You know, which was what the last fifteen or so issues. Yeah. Out, out, of, out, of, out of like an eighty or seventy issue run you know the marv wolfman the, the sal Buscema, oh my god i, I did a i did a, a video on the first captain marvel comic and it's the artist is bad <laughs> it, yeah it, yeah so these guys can start out rough and then yeah. and then they they learn their craft and they get better and they're working professionally so i'm hoping that the kids today come up with uh good stuff god, well maybe good to a 10 year old me may not be good to a 45 year well I, I will say this dr mask and I, uh if it was good to me as a 10 year old, it's still good to me as a 45 year old because, uh, you know, the emotions and, and the sentimental value to it, you know, like I, I went back and I rewatched the, the, the black hole. Do you remember that Disney movie with Maximilian, the robot with the, did you ever see are, that? Are you asking me? Um, anybody. Did oh. you see? Oh yeah. I, mean, I, I know the film. Sure. It's not, it's not a great movie, but man, do I love that movie? You know, I saw that as a little kid in, in, in the theater with my friend on his birthday and we loved it. We, we, we bought a model of, of the, of the ship and the little Palomino and we had the, 
the Maximilian toys. And then I watched the movie with my wife and my friends and were like, yeah, this is kind of bad, <laughs> you know, but, but I still love it. Yeah. You, you know, uh, I'll tell you what show I used to love as a little kid. It was because what happened was uh, I grew up in Vermont, but all my relatives were in Connecticut okay. right across the pond from you. <laughs> and um, so you remember we talked about this, about growing up watching New York television, WOR, WNEW, PIX, all that kind of stuff. <clears throat> which to you is like old hat. But if you didn't grow up there, you know, you don't realize how much you lost. And one show that I used to love watching when I would go to Connecticut was Lost in Space. Oh, yeah, yeah. And oh, I watched- dear. Oh, dear. Yo. <laughs> oh, the pain, the pain, my dear boy. Dr. Smith stole that show. I, I read that he was only supposed to be in the pilot and then, and then written off. But he everybody loved him. There's a spiel that he does. Um when he would do interviews and he, and he said, and, and the way he would tell the story is he said, Oh, I knew that they would write me off the show after six episodes because I was a villain, you see. So I, w- I, I would change the script. I would rewrite the dialogue. <laughs> and, and Irwin Allen came into my dressing room and he pointed his finger at me and he said, Harris, I know what you're doing. <laughs> and I said, yes, sir. And he said, keep doing it, Mr. Harris. And he walked out. And I knew that I had a job. <laughs> so, but no, I would watch that show. And going back today and watching it, um, it's terrible. So, I'm, so I, I, I'm, I'm like watching it, rewriting the dialogue in my head as I go. So there, there's stuff that we loved as kids. Right. Eh. Like, God, could you, could you old Doctor Who from the 70s? Oh, yeah. You you can't get anybody to watch that today. Yeah, oh, I, it, it, I, I, I like it. You know, yeah. I like it. You know, even my wife who likes Doctor Who, like there's times when she's just like, I, all right, I'm done, and she'll just, you know, I I, I still love the first Doctor. He's he's my Doctor. You know, oh, I'm a big fan of the third Doctor. Oh, the, my wife loves the third Doctor. That's her favorite Doctor, Mister Dashing and Suave. Yeah. The um, but yeah, I mean the special effects were pretty bad, and the pacing the of the show was. Kung Fu. Well, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, Joe. I know Venetian Kung Fu. We'll, we'll dispatch him with, with express intent. Yeah. And, yeah uh, so the, the original Star Trek, I, I was talking about it at work just, just two days ago. And guys are like, I can't watch it. You know, I, I really, yeah. And, and I, I, I can understand why people don't like it, I, but I grew up on it. You know, I mean, it, it wasn't bad back then. It was top quality TV at the time. And I still love it, but I, I recognize the flaws I reckon, you know, even, even next generation, if, if you get a DVD player and, and you could stop it, you could see like coffee stains on the carpet. You could, you could see like mist, like the cells on, on, on the ship that, that there's mistakes, on. but I still love the show. Oh, you know? okay. I, I, I think Star Trek is certainly within the top 10 series ever made. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, unfortunately, Star Trek ended with Next Generation with me. I, I, I tried to get into Deep Space Nine. I, I got through the first season. It was a chore. And the second season, I think I'm like six episodes into the second season. I, I just don't like it. Um, Deep Space Nine is Gunsmoke. Everybody says Deep Space Nine gets good around the third season, but I, I can't skip ahead. I have to watch it, and uh, I, I, I'm not liking it. Hercules and Xena. Yeah, Hercules and Xena was good. Good schlock, you know, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, as much as everybody all of a sudden hates uh, Josh Whedon. I never liked Josh Whedon, but I still like Buffy the Vampire Slayer. So when it finally got revealed that he was a creep, I was like, you know, I kind of intuition told me he was a creep, but I I still like those shows. I'll go back and watch them. You you know what it is? These shows were not written all that differently. Um, There's an old interview kicking around of... um, uh, Jim James Doohan and Harlan Ellison and Tom Snyder, and I don't know how much you know about Harlan Ellison. Yeah, he's a he's a hard person to, to deal with. Uh, he was brutally honest. It yeah. reminds me of Neil Adams actually, but um, but Harlan said um, told Tom Snyder he said Star Trek is a cop show, and Doohan got pissed, and he <laughs> goes he goes no it wasn't Harlan goes listen to me. The, the captain flies in on his horse, I mean his spaceship, he's got his ray gun, and he's there to set everything right, and as soon as he sets everything right, he takes off in his spaceship again. It's it's gun smoke. Don't worry about it. So all these shows, if you watch Wagon Train, if you watch Route 66... Yeah, I've always heard that Star Trek was Wagon Train in space. Uh, you know what that is? The, Wagon Train, when Star Trek was being pitched in 63, 64, 
was the number one show on television. Right. So Gene Roddenberry, if the number one show on television was a guy wrestling a duck, that's what Gene Roddenberry would have told NBC it was. Fair enough. Okay. So, so the um, do, for, forget Desilu, uh, Lucille Ball thought Star Trek was a show about celebrities in the South Pacific. I am not kidding you. Okay. <laughs> I never heard that. So no, no, that's something. You, oh, I and, believe you. I believe yeah. you. I just never heard it. <laughs> so, uh, so he went in and told the NBC pitch guys. He said, "Yeah, Star Trek is is wagon train in outer space." But if you watch the two shows, what you're seeing is you're seeing a story about people that has to be done on the cheap because they don't have any money. Right. And Star Trek had to add special effects that a lot of the other shows didn't have. So one of the problems with Star Trek films, why they don't do well uh, overseas especially, is because they are two people sitting in a room talking. Go back and watch Star Trek sometime. It's it, 50% of it is two guys standing in a room talking I, because I, it's I, a... When I started rewatching, my wife bought me uh, the DVDs of, of 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 Star Trek, and you know the remastered one where they redid the special effects. I I, I like them, you know. Sue sue me, you know what I mean. They, they updated the laser beams and the transporter, the remastered ones. I I like them, but uh, I was watching them, and I, I had a, I was in a game group with a bunch of young friends. They they were like in their late twenties, early thirties, and they talk. They they only knew Star Trek from the. Uh, the new movies, the Abrams movies. I'm like, yeah, those are action, space action movie X. You know, it's not really Star Trek. And so I started paying attention. I said, you know, it was 15 episodes of Star Trek before there was a space battle. Yeah. You know, it, it was mostly exploring the human condition. And they all laugh at me. And I said, that's why to me, Star Trek, the motion picture is the only real Star Trek movie. The rest of them are, you know, the Star Trek movies and the original Star Trek series. I like them both but they're different. I hate to be as geeky as all this, but I could probably recite Star Trek Wrath of Khan page <laughs> by page for the entire film without, from memory. So no, it, it, I, I, after, after start Wrath of Khan, it goes downhill a little bit, but, but no, I get it. I get it. And, and a lot of those old shows are very similar. You had the same writers working on them. They've been working on radio in the 1940s. Right. And Star Trek used the same sets from Outer Limits and some of the same writers. You know, it was the same production company, if I remember correctly. And, and they Outer kept they kept going because almost all the same writers that worked on Star Trek worked on Land of the Lost. Did you know that? No, no. Yeah, the, the, the producer for Land of the Lost was David Gerald. Okay. The guy who wrote The Trouble with Tribbles. And so um, he called up Dorothy Fontana and he called Harlan Ellison and he called Larry Niven and he called Walter Koenig. Hmm. And that, that's who wrote Land of the Lost. Okay, I didn't know that. Which is why the show is ten times smarter than anything else that Marty Croft ever did. Yeah, yeah. As, you, as you can tell, tell me it's, it's, it's smarter than Sigmund and the Sea Monster? Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> Although, Sigmund and the Sea Monsters had, um, oh, I can't remember her name. Um, the nanny on that show, I can't think of her name, but she was in The Man Who Came to Dinner with Betty Davis and Monty Woolley. If you've ever seen that movie, we're going to get a little obscure here. But um, Mary Wicks, Mary Wicks, and she did hundreds and hundreds of old movies, and she was fabulous. She's the nurse that has to wait hand and foot on money. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, yeah. Get, I remember the, the character, character, but I, 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 and I, I know of that movie, but I haven't seen it. The one that you talk, that was the, the shocking movie. From don't, don't, get me, don't get me started on Sid Croft. Sid Croft, who's still alive, very much with us, and does a show on Facebook or on YouTube, Every Sunday, he's about really? nine. Yeah, he's ninety-eight years old, and um, they had a very. He worked in theater and stage for twenty-five years before he started doing TV shows. So their formula was get somebody from the stage that Hollywood is going to buy into, so you can get the approval from the network to go ahead and produce the show. Okay. And so um, that's why they had Chuck McCann, Bob Denver, Jim Neighbors, Ruth Buzzy. Um, just all of these tremendous people that worked for them over the years. Charles Nelson Riley, yep. who was the director on Gin Game. I hope I'm not getting too obscure for you. No, no, no. I I I I, I think I'm I'm I'll be 55 next month. So I think you and I are around the same age. So and we watched the same shows growing up. So I, I know exactly what you're talking about. By the way, a little Keith Geffen tip of the hat. Keith Geffen and I had the same birthday. Oh, really? November November 30th. But yeah, I am I'm gonna be uh I think you might be one month older than me. Okay. Yep. So, um, but no, I, 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 is this a current picture? You don't have any gray hair? Um, that's all hair dye. 
Okay, I was going to oh, say because I, I, you know, I, I've only talked to you through the little image on on Twitter, so I, I just assumed you were a lot younger. <laughs> no, 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 no. I'm I'm 55. That's actually oh. a recent picture. So now um, that we're uh, we're talking about all this obscure stuff, you got you got to tell me tell the story about meeting Steve Ditko. Okay. <clears throat> so when I moved to New York, before, before you start, let me just say that I worked in that building for three years and didn't know it was Steve Ditko's building. Okay. Go. All right. So <laughs> um, I went to New York and I was looking for something to do with myself. And I went to Midtown Manhattan into Times Square and I saw this pretty girl and she had a clipboard with her. And I said, well, I want to talk to her. I wonder what she's selling. And I went over to her and she said, would you like to get a ticket to a Broadway show, sir? And I said, uh, not today, but, you know, what do you do? And she told me that she was part of a team of people that sold discount Broadway tickets. And if I and if I went with her to her office, she could get me a cheap Broadway ticket. So I wound up getting a job doing that. So my job was to stand around in Times Square and talk to the tourists and get them to go up to an office of oh, brokers. I, I probably brushed you off many times then. Uh, possibly, yeah. <laughs> and um, I used to work right at 47th and uh, 47th and Broadway, right on the walking plaza next to TKTS. I, walk, I, I worked right there. Yep. So, oh, you wouldn't believe the people I met just standing there, including what? Henry Winkler, Orson Bean, uh, Spike Lee. Uh, God, I can't even think of everybody. But so um, they just come wandering by. Um, yeah. So one day I found out, I did a little research and I found out that Keith Geffen, not Keith Geffen, Steve Ditko had an office um, in that building above the Stardust Diner. And I said, you know how many I, times I sat having lunch because I would, at the time I was an apprentice electrician. So I would, I would take classes. I sat in that diner doing my homework. Oh, yeah, you definitely. Know? Yeah. You know. I go to I go to the Apple Jack or I go to uh, the, the McDonald's. Jack, was right I'd there. Sit, and I'd sit with Jackie Mason and talk with Jackie Mason. Yeah, yeah, yeah. If, I, just if said, I knew it was Jackie Mason. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. What so, a, what a nice guy he was. So I went to. Um, oh, he was. You, you ever heard the story that uh, that uh, you know who um, Jackie Martling is? Yeah. Okay, Jack Martling ha ha tells a story where he was writing jokes for Jackie Mason. And Jackie thought every joke that Jackie wrote was hysterical. And he kept laughing and laughing. And he'd say, he'd say, did you write that? That joke? Was that you? You did that? That's incredible. You're, you're, you're amazing. You're wonderful. You're wonderful. And then, so they said at noontime, he says, Hey, I'll tell you what, anybody want to get lunch? I'm hungry. Let's go have lunch. So they said, yeah, sure. So they go down to the elevator and they get in the elevator operator says, what floor, sir? He says, take us to ground level. So they go down the fifth floor to the first floor. They get out of the elevator. Jackie Mason looks at the elevator guy and says, did you do that? You brought us all the way from up there to down here. You're incredible. You're amazing. You're, you're wonderful. You're incredible. That's how he did to everybody. So very gregarious man. Yeah. He, so, I, I was sitting there doing homework. And, you know, I, 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 you, you know, when you think you recognize somebody, but you're not sure. So you don't want to say anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I, he had a booth with his name on it, but I'm sitting there doing my homework, you know, for, for class. And I would look over and I would see this guy talking with people and, and I, he had makeup on. He was, so he was an older man with makeup on, which is a little unusual. And I would, and I was like, that guy looks familiar, but none of my business. And I, and then I'd go in, I'd go in Tuesdays and Thursdays for, for, for a year and a half, Tuesdays and Thursdays. So after maybe about my sixth visit, he was sitting there by himself and he was like, you're always doing your work. You're always you always studying, and I'm like, yeah, I I got I got a class. He's, oh, that's good. You 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 look old for a student. I'm like, yeah, well, you know, I changed career. And next thing you know, he would, hey, how you doing, John? You know, he remembered my name, and we we would just talk. And I'm like, you're Jackie Mason. He's like, oh, you didn't even know who I was. I was like, I I knew you. You know, he goes, why did you talk to me? I'm like, I talked to anybody. You were a nice guy. We sit there talking. Why not? You know, you don't live in Manhattan if you don't want to talk to people. You know. It's, Oh, yeah. Well, so I think I, he was a little impressed that I was talking with him, even though I didn't know he was famous, you know? How about this for a side story? This is going to get obscure. I don't know if you're going to know. Do you know who Freddie Roman is? Freddie Roman? No. Yeah. He was the dean of the Friars Club. He was good friends with Frank Sinatra, and he took over the, the dean of the Friars oh, Club. Oh, yes. Frank now I know died. who he is. I can picture his face. Yes. He was, just, he was just never on television. That's why people don't know him. But I was at a celebrity event, and there was a group of guys standing around with cameras. And Freddie Roman comes walking by and he says, hey, are you guys the paparazzi? And we kind of looked at each other. We said, yeah, I guess we are. He goes, he goes, I surrender. And he puts out his arms like to get a picture taken. Nobody knew who the hell he was. 
<laughs> so the um, you know very famous comedian, everybody at the Friars Club knows. And if people don't know who the Friars Club is, it's like the epicenter of comedy in the world. Like every every comedian ever that you've ever seen on television or film is a member of the Friars Club. Right. And what they do is they would have a roast once a year and, and they would like, you know, make fun of one guy like, OK, uh, Kevin Ryan is is now the, uh, the, 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 the celebrant and we would make jokes at Kevin's expense, you know, oh, and, they would just completely tear into you. They'd rip you to yeah. shreds. Yeah. Yeah. I, I used to love the Dean Martin celebrity roast. You know, P Peter Samedi and myself were talking about that when, when I was on his channel last week. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, 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 I love that old, that I, I, I love the old, uh, Borscht belt comedians. I, I, you know, growing up in New York, you, you love all the old Jewish comedians. I thought they were great, you know? Oh yeah. 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 I, well, I, well, I, I, I ever watched the movie Broadway, Danny Rose. With Woody Allen, you know, I've never were, seen it, but go ahead. Oh, but that's what that's about. It's by goofing on the old, uh, you know, uh, I, why can't I think of the guy's name? Uh, he he had the he had the talk show for years. Uh, you mean on WOR? Uh, Joe, yeah. Joe Joe Franklin, you know, Joe it Franklin, was, yeah, it was like it was kind of goofing on the Joe Franklin kind of this. Oh, my God. Anybody listen to this, I apologize. This is totally obscure New Yorker stuff. Joe Franklin had had a talk show on a shoestring budget and he would bring in like old vaudeville comedians and, and Borscht Belt comedians and you know and and, uh, and Billy Crystal used to make fun of him on Saturday Night Live until the point yeah. where Joe Franklin said could you could you please stop doing that? It hurt his feelings. You know and and Billy Crystal stopped but everybody would like would stop to go on Joe Franklin's little show. And they said it was like a little shoebox. Like his office was his desk. You know, he would be doing work on his desk and then, okay, we'll film it, you know. Well, and, no, uh, Joe, Joe Franklin was, it was just, he was dry as, as Melba toast, but, but he was on there for 3000 years yep. and he'd come on and he'd go, uh, thank you for uh, watching my show tonight. Well, uh, sponsored uh, by, 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 uh, Martin's paint. And yes, just no, paint. sponsored by Martin paint, not just paint. <laughs> yeah. And tonight my guests will be, uh, yeah. One of the guys from the Bowery Boys, Sonny Fox, and uh, Bonzo the Dancing Monkey. Yeah, and it was like Robert De Niro, Bonzo the Dancing Monkey, and, and like a kindergartner who who got perfect attendance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and but but I mean this this is New York television, right? Yeah. So yeah. so you got just all these characters, everybody from Soupy Sales to Chuck McCann. Um. So, and, so and all of these guys were, to to bring it back to comics. This Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, you know, and and all the original guys. Th th this was what they came out of, like these vaudeville, Borscht Belt, Jewish comedians, Brooklyn guys. You know, this was all that you like, like, uh, like, like when Ben Grimm would be like, "Oh, I waltzed right into that one." Or, or it's clobbering time. You know, this this is how these these comedians and, and Joe Franklin. These are the way these guys talked. Like, I didn't think it was bizarre. I, I, I was a little kid, you know, and, and uh, we'd be playing and I'd be like, uh, Framistats and, 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 and who's, you know, I, I was talking like Ben Grimm. I didn't realize yeah. I was talking like a, a 60 year old 1940s era, you know, rabbi. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I'd get into fight. You remember the, the fight between the thing and the Hulk and oh, the Hulk grab the thing at uh, uh, Fantastic Four 25. Yeah. And um, and they're they're fighting. And the Hulk grabs the thing by the arm and, and the thing yells, Hey, let go. That's the hand I ate pizza with, buddy. Yeah. You know, that kind of thing. <laughs> and yeah, that's where all that humor came from. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and even when I was a little, little boy, my father had albums by Myron Cohen, you know, so I would listen to all these, these guys tell jokes and, and yeah, that, that was my thing, man. So yeah. it, it all, it I, all I, I, I'm an Italian Irish Catholic kid, you know, and you know, I, Lenny, Lenny Bruce said, he goes. It, 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 uh, he goes. If, if you're from Brooklyn, you're Jewish. <laughs> he goes. He goes. If you grew, if you grew up in Brooklyn, I don't care who you are. You, you're Jewish. You know. I, I didn't grow up in Brooklyn, but my parents were from Brooklyn. You know. And oh yeah, because if you weren't Jewish, they kill you. <laughs> I was. I was lucky. I my my family was from uh, the New Haven, Connecticut area, so it wasn't quite as intense. But it was still pretty intense because, you know, we talked today about relations between uh, black people and and Hispanic people and white people. And back then it was the Irish versus the Germans versus the Italians versus the whatever. Yeah, so it was, it was just, scandalous that my Italian father married an Irish woman. You, you know, I'll tell you, you remember, I'm sure that you remember the Marx brothers, okay? Oh, yeah, yeah. Zeppo Marx got dragged into show business kicking and screaming by his mother. 
<laughs> he was a thug. He was he was into gangs. He was into fights, stealing stuff. And, and he had none of the Chico was into the same thing, but Chico was charming. So he got away with it. But um, but Zeppo uh, was was just a thug and he was headed straight to jail. And his mother said, here's your here's your option. We're going to send you to reform school or you're going to go on the road with your brothers. <laughs> and the night he went on the road with his brothers, he was going to take a, a Jewish girl out on a date, him and his buddy. They had two Jewish girls they were going to date. And he couldn't make it because they had to go on the road. So he went with his brothers. And the night that his buddy took the, his girl out on a, on a train. And um, because it was an Irish guy dating a Jewish girl, they stabbed his buddy to death. Oh, my God. And he would have been there. Oh, my God. That's how bad it was. Yeah. Well, so, you know, you know, Jack. Jack Kirby with the Yancey Street gang. Mm -hmm. that, that was what the Lancy Street was the was the was the real street that that yeah. the street got his, and that was bad. You yeah. know, I, my, I remember when I was a little kid, my father used to be like do your homework, you're gonna end up on the Bowery. And yeah. that was like a real threat, like not the Bowery, you know, and, and you know, the Bowery boys was on TV and it was just like gangs and fights and you know, and th and this is Jack Kirby. He was in a, a Jewish street gang. He was probably fist fighting with the Irish kids and the Italian kids and the black kids. You know what I mean? And just and he was he's a small guy, so small guys got to be tough. You know, big guys don't have to fight that much, but the small guys, you got to be scared. You know, you get into a street fight and and there's a small guy in your face. You know, he's the most dangerous. Yeah, you know they have Alphabet City down there with Avenue A, Avenue B, Avenue yeah, C, yeah. Avenue D. Okay. Well, Avenue A, you're A-OK. -okay. Avenue B, you better be careful. So Avenue C, use extreme caution. And Avenue D, you're dead. Yeah. We, you know, back in my punk days, you know, we we go hang out. There was a, what was it? Thompson Square Park was right on. And, oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And right on the corner there, there was there was King, Cut, King Tut's Wawa Hut. It was a bar that we used to go to. And we'd go into this bar and we'd drink. And it was the strangest bar because there was tables and couches and people watching TV. And then it wasn't until like the fifth or sixth time we realized this wasn't a bar. This was just some guy's apartment. This is how he paid his rent. He just painted King Tut's Wawa Hut over the door, left the door open. And when he, you know, when he wanted to go to sleep, he would close the bar. And when he wanted to make money, strangers would just come in this guy's apartment, you know, and there'd be drugs and nonsense going on, it, you know. But you well, know, this is the thing know. about New, this is the thing about New York. You cannot possibly control a population of eight and a half million people. You can't oh, no. do it. And, and it believe, and it's smaller than you think. Manhattan, you know, you you think you know you, you think it's it's gigantic, but Manhattan, the island of Manhattan itself is compact. You know, a dense. Well, I, I I came to figure out that living in New York City, it's not one city. It's a hundred little villages stuck together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, right. so the um. You can't control a population. I the stopped. Is anybody still listening to us? <laughs> but they will later. They'll catch it on the repeat. I'm not worried about it. I'm having a good time. Yeah. If you're having a good time. Yeah. So, uh, so, I, I, if anybody wants, I put I put a link that you could pop in and say something. I'm curious to see if it actually works. So they you, know, you know what it is? They're flabbergasted. Listen yeah. to this. Yeah. So the uh there's an old New York word for you. Yeah. So the um you it, it was the, the whole place was chaos. You you did things because you had to. And when you look at the old, Mar especially the old Marvel comics that Stan was writing, and then later Roy Thomas came in and wrote, this is the universe that these people existed in. Right, right, right. They, well, they were, believe it or not, what Kevin and I are talking about is old school Marvel. You know, like Greenwich Village where Doctor Strange lived. That's that's that that was a that's a real street. You know, yep. uh, that's a real address. That's a real. Ad that's where Roy Thomas was really living at the time. Yeah. And if you walk up Fifth Avenue, I remember, you know, one of my favorite comics was FF 25, which the Avengers and the Fantastic Four thing in the Hulk. And I'm walking up Fifth Avenue one day on the east side and I uh, got about, I don't know, 60th Street, whatever. And all of a sudden, here's Avengers Mansion. Yep. And what the fuck is it? And I went, it was the Fricky Museum. Yep. Yep. Because yep. Jack Kirby took the Fricky Museum and designed that around it. Or I went to, uh, what's the name of the park out behind the library? You know what I'm talking about? Uh, what the the, uh, the New York the 40 42nd Street Library down by Town Hall. Uh, Bryant 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 Park. You got Bryant it. Park. What, yeah. You know that the Baxter Building is supposed to be at the corner of Bryant Park. Yeah, I I, I worked in that building. That's when I say I, I I've I didn't quite work at Steve Ditko's building. I worked in that building. It used to be called the. Uh, 
it, it, it used to be called the merchant building at one yeah, point. The yep, the merchant building. So I, you... I, 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 I was the electrician for that entire building for four years. And then for six months, I was the, uh, the house electrician in, in, in uh, Steve Ditko's building. And then during that whole time period, I was taking classes and eating at the, the Starlight Diner and, and the Applejack Diner. And every, I, I, I wonder if Steve Ditko ever just walked by me, you know? Oh, probably a hundred times. Um, I probably I, wouldn't recognize them at the time because there's like no pictures of the guy. Well, one of the agencies I worked for, I'll get to, I, we were starting on down the road of, of Ditko. So oh, one but, but you were mentioning the Baxter building. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. Let's go. All, no, that's, all, that's, we'll, that's okay. We'll, this will all, this will all tie in. Yeah. So th this was the environment I was working in. And I remember looking it up one day, or I watched the, the, uh, the video of in search of Steve Ditko, where they went up to his apartment and tried to get yeah, him to do an when interview. I realized they worked in that building. When I yeah. And they, and they went up there with, they tried to get Neil Gaiman to convince him. And there was nobody that was going to convince yeah, him to Ditko do an interview. Probably didn't even know who Neil Gaiman was. No. <laughs> So, so I said to my, I turned to my buddy one day and I said, Hey, you know what? Steve Ditko is three blocks from us. And he goes, what? I said, yeah, he's got an office up there where he do, does his work. And my buddy says, yeah. So I said, well, I'm going to take lunch. I'm going to go up there and, and try to buy some art from him. I said, he's a what? what are you going to do? I said, yeah, I'm going to go up and try to buy was some a comic book art. Fan? What's that? Was your buddy a comic book fan? He, he was. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so he, go, he, he, he looked shocked. He's like, you're not going to go talk to Steve Ditko. Well, what's he going to do? Web shoot you? Exactly. Well, you know, the attitude is everybody goes, oh, my God, you're that guy. You know, and no, that's not how these people behave, actually. My whole channel is based on asking people to come here and talk to me. And look, look it's doing pretty well, if you ask me. And they do. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Um, I, I decided I, I went upstairs. I, I went to the front desk. I said, I'm looking for Mr. Ditko. And they said, yes, sir. Seventh floor. So I went up to the seventh floor and I knocked on the door. It said right on the door, big placard. It says S Ditko. And Steve, an Steve answered the door and uh, I did not take his picture very deliberately. Yeah. He wouldn't and, like that. No. And I said, I, I asked him, you know, I said, I'm a fan of your work and I'd like to purchase some artwork from you if you have some available. And he said, no, I don't do that kind of thing here. You'll have to contact my agent. And we talked for about five or 10 minutes. And I said, uh, well, thank you for meeting with me. And he was very polite. But I was very careful not to like fan gush with him. I wanted him to say, "Okay, I'm here to do business," and so that's that's how I met Steve Ditko. And yeah, then after I, that, I wonder if he shut the door and was like, "Oh God," you know, always he's just like, "Okay, that was interesting." Like, I, 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 I'd like I, I know he was a difficult person, and I know he was an odd person, and, and I hate to say, it, I, I wonder if there's mental issues. But I, I would like to think that he liked his fans, you know. I would no, I don't think he liked his fan. I mean, liked he, is not a good. He didn't understand. I, I think he was probably autistic, in a way. Uh, well, I, 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 I don't know if you know. Uh, what, one of one of my original uh, viewers is this guy Arthur Tripp. Arthur, Arthur uh, I'm sure it's way too late for Arthur, but he he actually knew Steve Ditko in his youth. Arthur was what they called a, a, a woodchuck. Uh, what what a woodchuck was was a uh, there were little kids so they were like fourteen years old they lived in Long Island they would go to Manhattan and they they would go to St uh, Stan Lee and Stan Lee would be like okay here, here's a uh, Long Island Railroad tickets go to Jack Kirby he his his work is is uh, is due so they Arthur would go to Jack Kirby's house and Jack Kirby would would give him an envelope with all the Fantastic Four artwork and then he would go back. To Manhattan, give it, give it to the Marvel guys. And they're like, okay, cool. Now go over here to Gene Colan's house, you know. And that's what they did. They would run around, and then while they were waiting for assignments, people would be like, "Yo, come here, kid, come here, kid, here." And then they would let them ink or color, you know what I mean? Or you know, sometimes they would type. And how great is that for a comic book fan? So, so, so Arthur met all of them. He's been to Jack Kirby's house. He's been to Steve Ditko. You know, he he met all of these people, and he said. And I, I don't think I'm quoting out of school that Steve would would like open the door three times. He would circle around his car. You know, he had so he I, I think he was like like maybe OCD and autistic. Who knows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, well, the thing, as I understand it, because I didn't know Steve Ditko and I'm not claiming that I'm buddies with any of these. Oh, people. yeah. You met the guy as best as anybody can, you know. Right, right, right. I and mean, he deliberately kept the world at arm's length. Right. And because um, I know I used to see him afterward. He was he would walk by our office all the time, which was right along, right across from uh, right next just past the Winter Garden. And um, 
he would just be walking by himself, usually, you know, wearing a trench coat most of the year and, and a hat and carrying a bag lunch. And he would, you would just see him walk by, walk by. I like the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of, yeah. And um, so uh, it was, I, I have, the, he would write people, let, people would write him letters and say, Mr. Ditko, can I have an autograph? And he would write back a letter saying, I'm sorry, I do not allow autographs. Um, please review my artwork. All everything you need to know is right there. Signed, Steve yeah. Ditko. Signed, Steve Ditko, and then send right. a letter back to him. And it's like, <laughs> what, what are you doing? So I think he just he didn't get it. He didn't understand why anyone would want to understand the artistic process of the person behind the work. Yeah, I, and, I remember a, a, a college people would ask him like, "I read all your Doctor Strange comics. Like, were you on drugs when you when you?" came up with all of these other dimensions and he would just get insulted. He would be like, I don't need drugs. I have my imagination. You know, you know, just the, just the idea of Steve doing drugs was like infuriating to him. Why would you even think that? <laughs> I, I'm trying to imagine what it was like for him working at Charlton because that was the workhorse area. And you yeah. just went in, you did your work and you had to do it in-house and he would just, Check in at nine o'clock in the morning and check out at five and do your work and go home. Yeah, that's that's another place because uh, my my you know my great grandfather lived right up the street from Charlton. That that was in Connecticut, right? Yep, Derby, Connecticut. Um, yeah. I'm gonna. You know what's funny is I I went where was I? But I went with a friend to visit a girl that that he was uh, interested in. I don't think they ever actually dated, and I, I had the car, so I drove. I was always you know the third wheel at that point in my life. And we were walking around, and there was a big brick building, and it said Charlton Comics on it. And I was like, "Is is this the Charlton Comics?" And she was like, "I, I don't know." Now, how did how did you get up there? Uh, we, we drove. I I drove. I had to drive because uh, my friend Sean didn't have the car, so I drove him to go see some girl that he knew from college. <laughs> yeah, it was it was it was right across from uh, the Charlton building. Was right across from a Stop and Shop, and it was in the same parking lot as a bowling alley. I don't remember. Was no, it a I, building? I, oh yeah, no. I mean, I I can't. I don't remember the exact configuration. What I do remember of it is that on the side of the building was the Charlton Bullseye. Yep. And then a picture of Beetle Bailey and a picture of Dagwood from Dagwood and Blondie. Yeah, so I I definitely saw it. I was always wondering if I if I saw it, you know. And and it was. I just thought it was funny because I'm like, is is this the Charlton? And there's, there's a girl who lived down the block from her the whole life. She's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, no, that's. Uh, by the way, it was uh, it was on a street called Hawkins Street. I, I wouldn't remember. I wouldn't remember. This, I'm I'm talking. This was probably like '89. Yep. Who knows? Oh, no, no, no. The, the 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 house that I'm talking about, my great grandfather's house that he he bought around 1900 when I was a little kid. My aunt Mary lived there. Okay. So I used to go there all the time, and I had no idea that Charlton was up the street, except I had another aunt that used to stop at shop at the Stop and Shop and the Bradleys across the road, and one day I said. Hey, is that the place where they make comic books? And she laughed and she said, I think so. They make some kind of magazine. And I said, can we go over there? And she said, what do you want to do over there? I said, I just want to look at it. It is important to me. I just want to, I just want to look at it. And she yeah. goes, okay, don't bother anybody. We'll go look at it. And then I just stood there for a minute and I went, ah, oh. and then I walked away. I didn't go in or bother anybody. It's funny when, when I was, you know, the apprentice electrician in that area, I was like, I, somebody was like, well, you, you know, DC gives tours. I was like, oh, really? So I, I, I'm an adult now. I'm in my dirty work clothes, and I, and I go in, and I just remember there's that little waiting area with, with the Superman, and the receptionist, and she's like, hi, and I'm like, hi, how you doing? And, and I'm like, I'm an adult. I'm in my 30s, and I'm like, can I get a tour? And she just started laughing. She goes, that, that's usually for kids. I'm like, I'm a kid at heart. <laughs> yeah, uh, you know what, John? We, we, we led parallel lives. Because I think it was 1982, I might be off by a year or two, but my mother took us to New York on a trip for eight days, and she wanted us to see all of the highlights, and, and the Woolworth counter, the FAO Schwartz, the whole nine yards. And uh, so we, I dragged my mother to Marvel Comics, and I walked in the door, and I said, do you guys give tours? And they laughed, and they said, no, we don't do that. And then um, I went down into the old Forbidden Planet store, and I don't know where the hell that was, but... I went to the Forbidden Planet store and I'm picking up my comics and on the shelf is the Fantastic Four issue where they fight Gormu, the giant monster. Remember that one, the John Byrne book? 
Yeah. It's about uh, FF260. You got something going on, on your screen? Uh, 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 some people are responding to me. I sent out a bunch of invitations to people like, what's going on? So I'm just typing it to somebody. Did, did I go blank? No, 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 not at all. You just, okay. you looked like something was going on. I'm just, I'm just so, typing out a response to some. No. So, uh, so I'm, I'm in the store buying my comics and I see the Gormu Fantastic Four issue and I picked it up and this fellow walks up behind me, this, this grown man. And he says, Oh, I see you're, re you're reading Fantastic Four. I said, yeah, it's, it's pretty good. He says, you, you like it? He, I said, oh, yeah. He goes, well, what do you like about it? And I said, well, there's this guy that draws it now. His name is John Byrne, and he's really good. He's doing all these great stories. And the guy said, really? Well, what are your favorite parts of the story? And I talked to him for about 10 or 15 minutes. And then I started to leave. And my mother, my poor mother's there who got dragged to every comic book store I could possibly find. And um, we're getting ready to head out of the store and figuring out what we're doing next. And all of a sudden, the light bulb went on over my head. And I went, Mom, hold on a second. My, I was all of like 12. My mother was losing her mind the way I disappeared in New York. And um, I ran over to this guy. My mother's like, where are you going? Where are you going? I said, don't worry about it, Mom. Don't worry about it. I walked over to the guy. I said, excuse me. Um, you look a lot like the artist John Byrne. And he lights <laughs> up and he beams and he says, that's because I am John Byrne. <laughs> and so it turns out the entire time I was critiquing Fantastic Four for John Byrne. Wow. And he was, you know, again, people always say he, I was just talking this before with, with, uh, with uh, Phoenix press and people like, uh, don't, don't, don't John Byrne's head's big enough. Don't, don't keep flattering him. But you know what? He earned it. He earned it. And, no, but I, he was, nice. he was goofing on a little kid. That's, that's kind of funny. You know, it's a good story. Yeah. And I was like, I, I, I ran into him at uh, New York comic con and told him the story. And he looks at me and says, Oh, that was something I might do. I think. Yep. <laughs> The um, so yeah, I've had a good time with comics. I mean, I, I I do not remember a time without comic books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ever. I, uh, the story I always tell about comic books was a. Uh, they were always in my life. I have two older brothers and two older sisters. And my older sisters, you know, there'd be Archie's in the house. My two older brothers, whatever. I I I remember them having Fantastic Four and and, and Daredevil and 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 uh, and, uh, and Thor, but uh. Casually, like most, like most kids, you casually got comics, you know, and uh, they would get to me eventually, but I couldn't read. And uh, I, I went to a, a new school. I transferred into a new school in third grade, and uh, I was in the bottom reading group. I, I told the story a few times. Stop me if, if, you, if you're bored. But I remember my reading partner was the kid Jordan. And Jordan was the kid that would go to the bathroom in third grade and come out with his pants down with his dangus flopping to the breeze, asking the teacher to wipe his hiney. There's now, always one. Go ahead. This is third grade. So, and then the teacher would, you know, what do you, what do you do? She wipes this kid's butt, pulls his pants up. And then he sits down next to me and we're sharing a reading book. I, I, I knew without anybody telling me that I was in the dumb guy reading group, I couldn't read. And because reading, you know, I don't know about you, but in third grade, did you go home and do math problems? You know, reading was a school activity. You know, in school, you no, read, no, you I was, I was always a reader. I was yeah, always I, a reader. I, I, yeah, not me. You know, when I was home, I was playing with my toys or, or running around like an idiot with my brothers and sisters and friends. You know, what I mean, I, I wasn't reading. You know, that, that's that's school. So I, 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 you know, the teachers were trying to teach me to read, and then I got to do homework. I didn't, do, I didn't do my homework. I, I, you know, I didn't do any homework until like sixth grade. But then I, I made friends with with, with, with with Sean and Carl, and they were they were already into comic books, you know. And I was like, yeah, I know, I know comic books. I know superheroes. I know Spider Man. How how can you not? I had a Hulk lunchbox, but I didn't have any Hulk comic books. And uh, now we're hanging out, and and we're reading. And they're talking about Black Panther and Black Bolt and all of these interesting characters. And now I'm looking at the pictures, and I'm borrowing their comics, and I'm buying the comics, but I I, I couldn't read them. And now I'm sounding them out and sounding them out, and I'm getting into it. To by the end of that year i remember i, I was no longer jay uh jordan's partner but i was marianne's partner and marianne was the goody goody girl you know that that was the teacher's pet you know so and i owe that all to comics to the point where i was in fifth grade i remember the school psychologist was, was doing a, a paper on me because i was reading books way beyond my reading comprehension you know i i, I remember specifically being in the, in the in the school counselor's office explaining Lamort that Arthur tour, you know, and I was taking copious notes and I had index cards with notes and she was writing all this. And then, I, and I remember I looked up at her, I said, am I in trouble for reading this book? 
She was like, no, no. I was like, because, you know, like had she said anything else, I think I would have put that book back and, and never read again, you know? No, you know, I was, um, I can remember being a little kid and a friend of my dad's, we'd be at parties and stuff. And this guy, Gene, would pull me aside and he, there would be a group of adults sitting there and he would say, he would say, Kevin, tell me the person who, who wrote Frankenstein. And I would say, oh, that was Mary Wollstonecraft Shelley. And he would go, look at this. How old are you? I said, five. He'd go, ah, okay. So, no, I, I, when I was, before I can remember, I would say it is quite likely that I was watching, I'd go to Connecticut to my grandparents, and I would watch Batman. And, you know, colorful, loud, bam, pow, the Joker, the Penguin. Ah! And then I went to a store at some point, and I said, Wow, they make books with these people in them. <laughs> so then I started buying Teen Titans because Robin was in it. And you know yeah. what the deal with Batman and Robin is? Batman is the guy you can grow up to be. Robin is the guy you can be right now. Yeah. Ah. So I got into Teen Titans. And from there, forget it. We were off to the races. I, I, I when, when I got up to Vermont, my father would take me to get my hair cut. And there was an old tiny barber. God, I miss the it, it, the kids do not know what they missed. I'm turning into an old man, John. The kids don't know what they get missed. Get off my lawn, Kevin. Yeah, exactly. So, <laughs> so I go to see Ray to get my hair cut. And Ray had a bottle. I don't know what the hell it was. It was some kind of liquor bottle. And it was the, the label had been ripped off. And there was a bat on the side of it. It might have been Bacardi, but it was just a generic bat. And he'd cut your hair and he'd say, hey there, kid, you want me to put some Batman juice in it? And he'd take a little hair tonic, put it in there. But he had a stack of old comics and he'd say, oh, you like reading those, do you? I said, yeah. He says, want to take a couple of them home with you? <laughs> yeah. So these were all like 1968, 67 comics. The first Eclipso. I sound like Gene Shepard. Who's Gene Shepard? You don't know Gene Shepard? Oh, no. Gene. oh uh, he, he was the voice of uh, he's the guy that wrote the Christmas story. He wrote the book. The Christmas story is based on and he narrates the movie. You know, you'll shoot your eye out, kid. Oh, okay. All right. Hmm. Yeah, you do. Not, you're not, now I can't not hear it. You do sound like it. But he he was a, you know, he would do a, a show on NPR and t and talk about them old days. You know, if you'd prefer, I can speak like this. I have no problem with that. So <laughs> no, the uh, you, you, you do have a great radio voice. You know. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So so great no, that, the great but, Gilda sneeze. Yes. The, oh, okay. I, I used to listen to him. I still listen to old time radio. The um. <laughs> You know, let's turn on turn on the shadow at three o'clock. And my, my father got me into the shadow when I was like, Yeah, I was asking your father, what 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 did you watch on TV when you were a kid? My father would laugh. It was no TV. We, we well, watched we, the radio. We got, a, we got a surprise guest over here. Oh, cool. What do we got? We got RJ from the fourth age. How you doing, RJ? I'm doing pretty good. Hopefully you can hear me. I got a little bit of a trouble going on here. I'm trying to set up my own live stream, but I saw your link and uh I didn't hear about Keith Kiffin. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, yes. I, I don't know if you know who Kevin Ryan is, but Kevin Ryan's been following me, and and, and he this guy knows, I, I don't know this guy knows more about comic books than anybody I've ever met, and he just <laughs> that Kevin Kevin Giffen died, and so I was just like, I was just about to go to bed, and that gave me like a shot of like unfortunate adrenaline. So now we're doing a live stream. So there you go, RJ, you brought up the speed. So it's okay, me. Well, uh, I have to say. One of the things I, I love about Keith Giffen, I had to jump on here just to say it because Keith Giffen's nine panel layout for Legion of Superheroes was one of the things that affected me as a comic reader more than uh, I care to admit. It was something that I really was thrown by when it first came out, but when he actually started to stop doing it or there was a there was an issue there where they stopped doing keith giffen's nine panel layout it just i didn't like it he was a master at, at panel layout and and mm -hmm. it's um again something <laughs> lost there uh with his death yeah I, I, absolutely i'd like to say first of all I, I am a fan of the fourth age i've listened to quite a few of your videos thank you yep yeah i i i love rj uh uh, yeah, I, I like I, I I say to people I, I may be an asshole but I'm a loyal asshole and uh, RJ was one of the first people to ever reach out to me so I, I I'm on RJ's side for from here to eternity you know so thank you RJ and it's always an honor when you come on my show uh, I, I I love I one day I hope to be a, a tenth as smart as RJ <laughs> <laughs> if I got I got to live another 150 years for that to happen but uh. uh uh, uh, RJ, I'm not. I'm going to say a line, and, and you're going to tell me. Astound this stone face. Do you know that line? I don't know where that would come from. If, if it's blocked, Kevin, you know that, right? I don't. Person. What's that from? 
oh, that's what when 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 Dark Side is facing the Legion of Superheroes, and and uh, uh the, Great Darkness. He, he, yeah, he goes, he goes, uh, he's he's like, you you face me, I'm astounded. Like like, how ridiculous are you to find? And 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 Karate Kid goes, astound this stone face. And then the next panel is all of them shooting their blasted beams and everything. It's just, it's a line that's been stuck with me for, for 40 years ago in the great darkness. Astound this stone face. Like I'll call up my friend, Kevin. And I mean, I'll, Kevin, I'll call up my friend, Mike. I'm get, starting to get tired now. And I'll pick up the phone. He'd be like, hello. And I go, astound this stone face. And that's it. We're talking about comic books for another two hours on the phone. You can hear his kids crying in the background. He's like, I'm talking to John. <laughs> hey, hey, John, if you ever get an interview with Jim Shooter, you, you got to ask him about Karate Kid because that's his character. Yep. And probably had a better fleshed out background than any character in the Legion because right. he, he was the son of a Japanese assassin and some, you know, noble woman. And his father was the black hand. And there's a whole thing. And and yeah. So the fact that Levitz gave him that amazing line in that story does not surprise me. Yeah. RJ, you, you talk about a, about that, that Jim Shooter created Karate Kid because he, he was tired of the pointy powers. That's exactly I what he said in one of the uh, interviews that he did. He was he was so uh, bored with writing characters that could just do things by pointing at them. So he decided to make something dynamic. And that's when he came up with Karate Kid. I always use him as an example just because of the fact that in order for him to create this character, he said he had to dive into the world of karate in order to understand it. And that's something you don't see within writers today. Right. He, he actually had to learn. He had to go out and do some research. <laughs> Can you believe that? L live outside of his own personal life to, 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 to learn how to do a character. Uh, we would talk, uh, Kevin, we were talking before and I got sidetracked when mm -hmm. we were talking about writers. Uh, I had a, a, a writing teacher. His name was uh, uh, Marguez, and I, I can't remember his first name, but he, he was from South America. And somebody said to him, he goes, shouldn't you, should, you know, don't you think it's disrespectful to write uh, about American Indians when, when you're not an American Indian? And, and Professor Marguez said, have you have you read my novel and the whole class was embarrassed to admit that they didn't read his novel and he goes i i write about an irish immigrant who comes to america in the 30s he goes do i look like an irish immigrant you know and the whole class nervously laughed i started laughing because i i never believed right you know he goes but i do my research <laughs> you know and that's all he goes if you write about whatever you want but you better do your research and that's what jim shooter did he did research at the, at the karate kid i i think you try to get the sense of who the character is. Sometimes you succeed. Sometimes you're just, uh, you're just finger painting. Uh, one of the things I thought was funny when I read the early Batman, the stuff that was actually written by Bill Finger is that Batman has a, um, has a, uh, a stool pigeon that he got like an informant that he uses to get the, uh, the, to try to get in, involved with the opium gangs in Gotham city in the thirties and forties. And the guy runs a curio shop is he's an old uh, Asian guy named, Get this. His name is Sin Fang, because that sounds Asian. It's actually Gaelic. <laughs> the, the Sin Fang is the is the militant ar uh, arm of the IRA. Right, but, right. But right. right on the front of the curio shop, it says Sin Fang. So sometimes you get the background right, sometimes not so much. Well, that's because Bill Finger didn't do his research. Yeah. Well, they were all living in New York. You know, whatever they saw, you walked out the door. That was your research. Yeah. Yeah, RJ, we. Uh, RG lives out out in the woods. We were talking about uh, New York and it, it, its influence on, on on the world of comics, and then then we we talked about uh like real world locations. They the, look like the the Frick Museum is is Avengers Mansion, and the Merchant Building was the Baxter Building. You know, yeah, it's, it's a massive, massive impact. I I just talked about it uh, probably about three months ago when I covered an interview with. Um, Oh, uh, Frank Miller saying that in, to get inspiration, he would go up on the rooftops uh, and just sketch out things oh. in order to have backgrounds for his oh. books. So, yeah, you know, I, I talked about when, uh, when when I was talking about uh, uh, his, his first run on 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 Daredevil. That uh, one of the things that I always loved about Frank Miller was Daredevil and Elektra and Bullseye. They would always be on the on the buildings, and you'd see water towers and wires, all that stuff that we we just like conditioned to ignore. You know, I, I pay attention to that stuff because I'm up there repairing that stuff, you know, working on that stuff, you know. The and, funny, you know, it's really there. Yeah, I it's mean, really there. But, but yeah. like, uh, <laughs> it, it, it's funny because uh, uh, I was, where was, I was talking to a friend and 
and I just stopped and I pointed and he's like, what, what? And I'm like, look at that pipe work on that building. How, how is it slanted like that? Doesn't that drive you crazy? He goes, you live in that building and you look at that pipe work and it's slanted. He goes, that pipe work didn't exist until you pointed to it. <laughs> you know, that, yeah. and that's the kind of stuff Frank Miller would, would put in his notebooks and, and put in Daredevil. And that's, you know, and, and we still love Frank Miller because he made it real. I, I assume that both John and RJ, I th- assume you've both seen the Super Friends. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, yes. The the Hall of Justice actually exists. Oh, it's yeah. The, it's the train station in Toledo, Ohio. Okay. Look it up sometime. It's that is a, they they took the Hall of Justice or took this train station and made it the Hall of Justice. Oh, Ke- Kevin, with your radio voice, can you say "Meanwhile at the Hall of Justice"? Meanwhile, back at the Hall of Justice. <laughs> that's yeah, that's actually Ted Knight doing that. Yes, that's Ted Knight. Yep. RJ, we, somebody said that he sounds like Gene Shepard. Do you know who that I is? I have RJ? to say, no, not off the top of my head. Oh, okay. he, he, but he, I was he, just he, thinking he, about Super Friends, and I was saying, thinking to myself, whenever I hear Dark Side or read Dark Side in any book, it's the it's the um, the old uh, Super Friends voice for Dark. Oh Side. yeah, it's funny because I I picture. Uh, it, it's funny that you said that because I thought I was the only person. I, I I give voices to the characters in my head, and Dark Side is Jack Palance's voice. <laughs> Well, the original, if you watch the original Fantastic Four cartoon from Hanna-Barbera, that's Ted Cassidy doing the thing. Oh, really? And then later on, the the 78 version, that's Chuck McCann. Oh, okay. So whenever I hear the thing, I always hear him as Chuck McCann going, uh, saying, hey, it's the idol of millions, the ever-loving blue-eyed thing. (laughs) Benjamin J. Grimm, it's clobbering time. Because that's how Chuck would do it. Yeah, yeah. And he, he was, you know, he's another New York original. Yeah, yeah. Com- comic books are in New York. Is, is, is You know, like I said. You can't have comic books without New York. Yeah, yeah. As somebody in the chat asked if, if I, you know, if if I knew about a lot of the Queens. I was like, comic books are, are a product of New York. It's like Coney Island, you know, knishes, hot dogs, you know, bagels, comic books. These, you know, I, I, I'm not taking away for anybody else. Comic books are an American thing. You know, and and I I do think that they're an important like baseball and jazz, you know, uh, like what what else is it are uniquely American besides baseball and jazz and comic books? I'm trying to think. A good friend of mine who knows not a thing about comic books at all. I, I asked him when I said, you know, what do you think of this hobby of mine? What I know about it, and he goes, I think you've discovered a uniquely American art form that that is equally important as jazz to the development of American culture. And I said, thank you. Yeah. Uh, can you imagine if all of a sudden all the jazz musicians started hating their fans? <laughs> you know, like I, I, the modern industry, like, eh, how do you, you know, we're going to play some jazz music, but we don't want any of these old jazz fans. We want, we want news jazz fans. Get rid of the old people who listen to Coltrane and, and, and Charlie Parker. You, you know what the problem is today? <laughs> the, I, 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 again, get off my lawn, but the, the problem today is that they're not high. What Roy Thomas walks into Marvel Comics, and maybe I'm getting the story wrong. Sorry, Roy, if you can hear this. But Roy walks into Marvel Comics. Roy, if you can hear this, come on my show. Yeah, well, you know, talk to John Cimeno. Maybe he'll set it up. So um, he, uh, he he walks into the Marvel office and he says, hey, can I work here writing comic books? And Stan looks at him and says, you want to write comic books? Really? Are you serious? You want to work here? Because that, that's how the, these guys, they couldn't believe that there were actually adults that read the stuff. It blew them away. So, wow. Yeah, Roy Thomas was like the first new hire, right? Yeah. yeah. So the, what's going on today is instead of these people who are trying to get into comic book, Neil Adams had a story, and this I know is accurate, is uh, he walked in to get a job at a, at a comic book company. I think it was DC. And the guy looked at him and said, whoever he's talking to, the editor said, kid, do yourself a favor and find another job. And Neil said, why? He said, because in five years, this is in 1968. He says, in five years, there won't be any comics. Hmm. And Neil said, well, I'll take the job in the meantime. <laughs> yeah. And 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 so today what's going on is they go over to Columbia University to the journalism program. People who don't know the first, pardon me, the first fucking thing about comic books. And they go, hey, do you, I, I looked at your resume. You've got a, great, a 4.0 GPA. You want to come write comic books? And they go... Well, I want to say something about the socioeconomic condition of this, that, and the other. Screw you. They, they're writing, gar- a lot of them are writing garbage. Well, they're and writing not- propaganda. Yeah, they're writing propaganda. And it's not because there were some writers, like I said, in the early days that their work was tough to get through. 
but they got better. The difference with these guys is that they're smart people. They're, they're they they sort of know how to write. They just choose not to, and the editors let them get away with it because they're in on the joke. Well, that's why I blame. I blame. I, I don't. I don't blame the people who want a paycheck. You know, and I, you know, and and let's face it, it is cool to write Spider Man. It is cool to write Iron Man. You know, so, <sighs> you know, but uh, I I blame the editors. Sorry to interrupt you there, John, but I'm going to have to go because my yeah. live stream is about to start. Yeah, so, but like, I wanted to just jump on and and talk about uh, uh, Keith Giffen for a minute and uh, anything say, you want to say before you go. No, but anybody wants to jump onto my live stream after you're done with John, well, you know, you I, I got to go to bed. I, I was going to go to bed an hour ago. So, yeah. So anybody, anybody here, go over to RJ and, and he's going to make comics fun again. Good to, good to <laughs> talk right, to thanks, you, RJ. Go. Oh, bye. Good. Yes. Kevin, I could, Kevin, RJ, I could talk all night long and I, I, I didn't even realize it was 1030. I was enjoying myself. Hey, hey John, well, we, you know, we can, we can set up for part two, if you like, at some sure. point. I would, I would love to, I would but, love you know, cause you know, we never, I'm not, like you said, I, I think, yes, I, I would agree with you that I'm probably more charitable toward the current state of comic books than you are. And the reason... That'll be our topic. How about... How well, about, let, let, let me give you... Can I give, can I give you the, the, the sneak preview? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. The sneak preview is this. If you go back to the 60s, I'm the comic books were selling... Go for it. <laughs> the comic books were selling 500,000 copies a piece. And they were give, they were selling them for 12 cents. And if you wanted to buy a paperback book, it was 85 cents. So you could get a comic for nothing. You got a comic for the price of a candy bar. And then the, the, the numbers started dropping when they raised the price 30, 40, 50 cents. And then you had that clown come in from uh, um, Coleman Stobes. What the hell was his name? The guy, uh, I want to say Ike Perlmutter that bought Marvel. Yeah. He's now sitting on the Disney board. And they said... He said, how many comic books can you produce and still go do quality? They said, oh, about 50 a month. That's the number of people we have. And he said, good, make 100 because I want to make money. So now instead of one Spider-Man book or two Spider-Man books, now you got eight or nine coming out a month. And nobody can keep up. So all this, they're competing against themselves. Right. And that's why you're seeing numbers 50,000, 30,000, 20,000. There have always been good comics. There have always been crappy comics. I love what's coming out of Comicsgate. Don't get me wrong. I'm not taking a thing away from Malin or Van Skyver or any of those guys. They're great. What I'm saying is we've always had woke bullshit. Look at Denny O'Neill. You know, if you read the 1960s Justice League, he's talking about uh, race relations. He's talking about uh, environmental toxins, poisoned lakes, all this kind of stuff what they were doing with the hard traveling heroes, Green Lantern, Green Arrow. They had woke bullshit back then. Yeah, I'll counter that. by They also had Steve Englehart with, uh, you know, Richard Nixon and the Sons of the Serpent. But, oh, yeah. I, but, I'll, but I'll say that, uh, that, that does, hard does, traveling heroes... Doesn't, we, doesn't we Steve Englehart have you know, Richard... Doesn't have Richard... Uh, Steve Englehart have Richard Nixon shoot himself in the head? Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, go on. We... we but, but we, we think about that, but we forget that those sales dropped, that they, they dropped hard traveling heroes and, 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 and brought back the continuity to bring sales back up. That that Steve Englehart sold so bad, they brought in Jack Kirby to, to revamp Captain America and he came back with the mad bomb. You know, so yeah, they always tried it, but it it, it, it didn't sell back then either. No. And I, I'm going to let me give Steve Englehart credit. Steve Englehart, I but think, Steve is probably, was a good writer, though. Steve Englehart was the best writer to come out of the Bronze Age, in my opinion. Great writer. Just saying. Okay. So I'm not denigrating these people. Or no, saying, no, no. And yeah, Denny yeah. O'Neill, I, Denny O'Neill, to me, when he died, it was the, uh, the, the, the nail in the coffin of comic books. Boy, but did they get preachy? And they yeah. still will, given half a chance. A lot of them. Look what's going on with Jerry Conway and the Punisher. You know, I, I created one of these these American icons that I now completely reject. Right. Well, it's easy to say that when you're not getting any royalties. Do you, do you think you would change his tune if, if, if he was making money off the Punisher? Uh, in Conway's case, I would say no. Really? I, I, th I think Conway, I think Conway's an ideologue. Uh, really and it's the same, it's the same thing with Chaikin. You know, uh, Chaikin is capable. Chaikin, have you read Hey Kids comics? No. Is it any good? It's very, very good. The um, but but Shaken is about as left wing as you get, and but and they he still wants tried to cancel him. <laughs> What's that? They still tried to cancel him. Um, well, because he wants to do what he wants to do. 
Well, because he, I, I, he had that character. I can't remember the name of the comic book, but it turned out that a, a, a transgender character got got killed, and they were like, "You, you see, uh, even this comic book isn't safe for transgender people." It's like that's the point of the comic that a transgender person, person got killed. died. They, yeah, they tried to they tried to cancel Jake, and he had to issue an apology and everything. It's like, you know. Well, the point is, these guys, when it comes to, I, I'm a, I'm a conservative, no doubt about it, and um, these guys can't keep their own rules straight. Right. You know, when you have a circular firing squad, you're going to get hit with a bullet sometime. Yep. But uh, but I'll tell you, back in the day, we had editors, we had people like Julie Schwartz and Stan Lee, who would look at the stuff coming in and go, "No, you're not doing this." Right. This is this is too much. Because they were, they had to answer to the guys upstairs. And, and for I, the most part, you know, comic books were left wing. You know, Stan Lee was a Democrat. You know, Jack Kirby was, was was an old school Democrat. You know, but they didn't play politics, or if they did play politics, they were very subtle about it. Uh, like a uh, R, R uh, not R J. Uh, see, I'm getting sleepy now. But uh, Richard Meyer, he would always talk about Innocenti. Who's who's about as left wing as it could come, but uh, she she was a good enough writer that she did the research and she uh, she wanted to show the other side, not as bad guys, but like you know, the, the she she was again. I'm 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 starting to like I'm really fading all of a sudden. She she showed both sides and neither one of them were just straw man attacking each other. She she was a quality writer. These days. If, if, if you're slightly conservative, you, you, you're, you're Satan. You know, it, it's caricatures. It's, 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 it's bad writing, you know. Now, back in the day, well, I think we covered this. Back in the day, you had I to want to work in, yep, you, you had to want to work in comics. Now they're going out and headhunting these people who have nothing to do with comics. And they do have a point that the consumer is not their, is not their customer. Uh, right. They're selling to comic stores and they're selling to libraries. Right. So imagine, if you will, you're a librarian and the the order comes in, you know, you get the, the scholastic catalog and you say, well, what am I going to buy for my kids? And it says the description is um, uh, a 14 year old black disabled girl uh, deals with life as she enters teenagehood. And they go, all right, I'll buy 50 copies of that because, you know, we need to teach the kids diversity. So so the book sells. And so DC says, we'll make more. And that's how you get stuff like I am not Starfire. Have you seen that nonsense? Yeah. Yeah. Ugh. It, hey, no, Matt, it, it, I sent you an invite if you want to come in for a couple of minutes. I'm not going to stay around too much longer. Sorry, I'm keeping you up. So, the, if, I you were, I was, if I wasn't interested, I would have shut it off a while ago. Okay, cool. The um, I'm starving and I got to finish my sandwich. <laughs> that's that's fine. I'm I'm uh, I'm sucking down a monster drink. I'm I'm in good shape. The um but that, I got, that's what I got a roast beef and, and, and on I got a roast beef and, and, and mozzarella on, on garlic bread. Oh hey, there God. you go. That's a good New York yeah, deal they, they, you got going. New York, you can't beat the sandwiches over here from, from Chubb's Deli. <laughs> you gotta have your boar's head, you see. Yeah. You gotta get you gotta get it's the only thing they sell what my wife New York. From Canada and she was like, What's with this boar's head? Like everybody in my family is like, You gotta get boar's head, you gotta get boar's head. And then finally she was like, Yeah, you're right, boar's head is great. <laughs> well, how you doing, Pops? What's up? How you doing, John? Pretty good, pretty good. Uh, uh, just to give you a recap. I'm not staying on too much longer, but I'm here with uh, Kevin Ryan, and we're talking. Uh, the uh, he he posted that Keith Giffen had died. Yes. So we, it started out talking about Keith Giffen. Now now we're talking about roast beef sandwiches. Uh, <laughs> it's I'm, it's I'm, all part of the New York experience, isn't it? Yes, pretty much. Isn't that how it always goes. Isn't that uh, how where it goes? where do you live? Uh, I'm in Southwest Michigan. Oh, okay. Have, have you? Ever have you ever been to New York? I'm, I'm out in the boonies, man. You know, it's like uh, I, I went for a walk earlier and, and walked up on a, a doe and two fawns. And they didn't even know I was there. I was like 15 feet away. And when I pulled my camera up to get some video, she saw me and poof, she was gone. I was like, there was, there was a deer on my lawn a couple of weeks ago. You know, Pops, so uh, close, uh, Pops, I'll tell you, I'm in northern Vermont. And about 10 years ago, we went out, everybody went out uh, on a cigarette break and the, I walk back in the office and there's nobody there. And the boss comes out of her office and she says, she says, boy, you folks are taking a long cigarette break. How come you're the only one that came back in? And I looked at her and I said, because there's a moose standing next to your car. <laughs> yeah, I, 
I, when I lived in uh, Arizona, northern Arizona has the big, the elk, you know, yep. I mean, the things are freaking huge. Yep. Yeah. We had, we had a baby moose. But, but you know, it's funny. You're from Michigan. That kind of ties into what I was going to say about John's sandwich. Well, there's a jump. <clears throat> but I have a friend of mine out in Phoenix, Arizona. And uh, I was telling him I was having a liverwurst sandwich. And he says, let me go to the supermarket and look to see if I can get liverwurst. You couldn't buy liverwurst in the supermarket. They didn't have it. And Where I know it. Phoenix? Yep, Phoenix, Arizona, yeah. I lived, I lived in Phoenix for 35 years and I like liverwurst. <laughs> well, hey, in Detroit in the Midwest, it's all it's all like German guys. New York City, it's all Germans. You go out to the uh, Phoenix, you can't find a liverwurst sandwich. What's wrong with those people? Well, you you didn't find a sandwich in the restaurant, but you could buy liverwurst at the grocery store and make your own. That's well, that's true. But I mean, you're you know, I'm just saying, you know, yeah. we're talking about New York and growing up and living the New York experience. It's and if you can't deli. find liverwurst, you're in the wrong town. I'm telling you it's that right not now. It's a deli thing there. They don't really have a deli scene in a deli of no. New York. Not, nothing like a New York deli. Yeah. You know what's amazing, John? You may not realize this, but outside of where you live, nobody knows what the hell a candy store is. Really? No, they they don't call it that. They you, they call it like the the corner market or something. They don't call it a candy store. Well, they got um like actual candy shops in some of the malls where basically everything they sell is candy. That's it. Yeah, yeah that's not what we're talking. John, you know what I'm talking about, yeah. right? What, I said it a lot of times in my videos. There was a place called Howie's by me. Now, when I was a little kid, my mom would give me a dollar every day for, for, for lunch in the school. And uh, I, I would go to, there was a candy store right next door to my school, and I would buy a comic book. A comic book was like a quarter, and that would leave me 75 cents for lunch. And I would, I would two quarters for, for, for two pizza bagels and another quarter for a chocolate milk. One quarter for a comic book it was perfect, you know. And as comic book prices went up, I would adjust my lunch based on on the price of comic book. But th there was Fred's candy store, and then if they didn't have it, there was Sven's candy store, and then Howie's. And then Howie was this old guy. He was old when I was a little kid, so God knows how old Howie was. And the only thing older than Howie was Howie's mother, and they lived in the back of the store. And Howie's mother had Alzheimer's or dementia and stuff. And every once in a while, she would come walking out in, in her nightgown. And, you know, people would make fun of her. And I just remember, like, because my grandmother going through the same thing, I was very sympathetic. So I'd be like, Howie, here comes your mother. And he would be like, watch the store. And he would be like, Mom, and, you know, walk her back. Come to think of it, it might have been his wife that he was just calling Mom. You know, and because of that, he liked me. Now, he would just let me spend all day. And he had comic books. It was like an alcove. It was this roundish thing, and he never returned the comics. So whenever you wanted comics, you would go, and I would be late for school because I was looking for comics, you know. And that was a candy store. It had candy. It had toys. It had stationery. It had crayons. Is, is that what you're talking about? A candy store? Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what, I, what, I, little rascals would be next to me, you know. It it was that kind of old store. The, mo that, the modern equivalent, so to speak, would be like a CBS. Yeah, yeah, but a CBS yeah. is too corporate. This, you know. This this was a mom and pop shop that they actually lived in. Yeah, yeah, but they were all called candy stores. Yeah, they were called candy stores, but you could get greeting cards. You you could get. And, and I'll tell you what, from li from living in New York, magazines, lottery from, tickets. From tobacco. living in, get this, from living in New York, you walk up to the counter. See if you remember this. You walk up to the counter, and the fellow behind the counter says, looks at you and says, "What can I get for your boss?" Okay. So I, I'm up, I go back to Vermont. I go into a Subway sandwich shop. I walk up to the guy at the counter. He says, what can I get for your boss? I said, where'd you work in New York? <laughs> goes, I work in the Bronx. What are you talking about? Yeah, I'm from the Bronx. Yeah, uh-huh. It's funny. I, I moved to Albuquerque in, in, in 1993, and I got a job at a pizzeria. And uh, from, from 90 to 93, I was a tiny part owner of a pizzeria here in New York, you know, so I, I started out as a delivery guy and rather than give me a raise, they're like, how about we give you a percent? How about, you know, so every year they, they gave me a percent. So that was just their way of keeping me. And I, I got 3% of the pizzeria, but I learned how to spin pizza and everything. So when I went to Albuquerque, I got a job and I was like, yeah, I can make pizza and blah, blah, blah. And they're like, okay. And I'm washing tables. I'm washing dishes. I'm like, I, I, I can make pizza. You know, why, why, why are they doing this? You know? So finally, Somebody calls in sick. 
I'm like, John, can, can you make pizza? I'm like, yeah, boom, boom, and I'm spitting. They're like, oh, my God. Like, they, they don't do that anywhere outside of New York. They, they called the newspapers. They were taking pictures of me. And yeah. then I, I took the newspaper, and I said, hey, I want to raise. And they said, oh, no, we can't afford it. I started walking out with the newspaper. They said, what are you doing? I said, I got my resume right here. I can get a job at any pizzeria in town. So like, come back here. You got your raise. <laughs> yeah. Isn't and, that it, man? New York produces, I hate to say it, one out of eight people in the United States lives in New York. That's why I don't think this stuff will be boring down the road. People watch this on repeat. Um, everything good comes out of New York, including comic books and Keith Geffen. Yep, yep. That, that's so, so pops. We we this this whole thing started talking about Keith Geffen. Do you have a, anything you want to say about Keith Geffen? I'm sure he would love the fact that we're talking about roast beef and sandwiches and everything. Dude, it, it's just crazy because I mean you got. I, obviously, John, you know, the older we get, the more people check out that meant something to us. Right, or, right. You know, that we knew about or knew of or knew in 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 life. The older you get, the more people you lose. And it's like now it's it, – it, it, and when you get older, and all, you almost get a little bit indifferent to it because it happens all the freaking time. You know what I mean? It's like it seems like it's it's like once a week somebody I know or know of or um, had some kind of inspiration from or something yeah. you know in life is gone. I, I I remember the first celebrity death that that got me was John Candy. You know I was a big SCTV fan. You know and when he died, John Belushi died when I was in third grade and everybody told me I looked like John Belushi. So but but I didn't know who he was. I, you know. Third grade's kind of too young to be staying up watching Saturday Night Live. But uh, by the time John Candy died, I was like, oh, my God. You know, so that that was the first celebrity death. I think the one that got to me the most was Neil Peart. Oh, you know? I saw Rush 12 times. I know exactly yeah. what you're talking about. Yeah, you, I saw like 20 you, you know, you know, Neil Peart, Neil Peart was one of these guys where it wasn't that he didn't appreciate his fans, because you've seen interviews with him, Pops? Oh, yeah, he, look, he was a total recluse. I worked at a radio station in Phoenix back in the 90s. What and, station? Uh, Z-Rock, the oh, affiliate. Was that, uh, was that Dave Pratt? Uh, no, that was AUPD. That was, yeah, yeah, okay. And, and yes, we, um, my, my dude that I worked with also worked with him and actually subbed for him when, when he would be go on vacation, then my partner, Rob, would do his show. It was awesome. Right, but, go, but go on with Neil Pert. Okay, go ahead. Dude, Neil was just like, he was kind of recl a recluse. He didn't do interviews. He didn't do the, the meet and greets very often. He, I mean, the meet and greets were a very rare thing. Uh, he didn't sign stuff. If you wrote a letter to him and he responded and sent you a letter back and signed it, Neil Pert, you were lucky. You got you got a Neil Pert autograph. You remember the line? I can't remember what song it's from. Spirit of Radio, I think. He says, I can't pretend a stranger is a long awaited friend mm -hmm. because that's how he was with fans. He's like, I appreciate that. You love the music. I don't know you. I, I understand the adulation, but I can't respond to it the way you want me to. And was, um, I know I've always, I know they've always told you that selfishness was wrong, but yet it was for me, not you that I came to write this song uh, yeah. anthem from the fly by night album way yeah. back in the beginning. It was one of, Favorite quotes of his. You but know? you know, John, John, I hope I'm not boring you, but no, not this, at all. Because because I, I know you're a music guy too. I I used to go see Rush at the Montreal Forum because we you know we were right near Canada. So I went to see Rush one night, and I'm I'm we're getting it's getting to be time to head out of the show at the end. And I'm walking through these doors, and this guy comes the other way wearing a hoodie with his hands shoved in the front pocket. And I looked over and I said, Neil. And he looks over. <laughs> he, he looks over. He goes. He just looks at me and he just turns and runs down the street. Was he, he shy? He, no, he, he did. He just never wanted to talk to any fans ever. And actually, that night I went around the other side of the building and wound up hanging out with Alex Lifeson out on uh, Atwater Avenue. One of the absolute funniest guys in music. The the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame acceptance speech by Alex Lifeson is classic. John, have you ever seen that speech? No, no. He, Alex I, 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 I'm been, an old punk rocker. I don't can, like the rock and roll. Can I get this one, Kevin? Because because anybody who knows the story of Rush and being snubbed by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame and being snubbed by Rolling Stone magazine and all that throughout their whole career, he says he tells this whole story 
with one word. Yeah. And the way he says the whole thing, if you knew anything about their history, you could follow along with what he was saying. He's like, blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, we got the call from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame finally. And then he was like, blah, blah. You know, it's like you could tell. You could tell what he was saying through the whole acceptance speech, and he never said any word except blah. It, it's kind of like, John, it's kind of like an artist, you know, drawing a comic story, and without the words, you can follow the story along. Good storytelling, yeah. I'm so, a, 10 it, minutes. So, not a, not a chart, ten minutes, not a Howard Chaykin story. <laughs> What's that? I said, so it wasn't a Howard Chaykin story. As much as I love Howard Chaykin, you take the words out of a Howard Chaykin comic, you have no idea what's going on. Right, right, right. <laughs> we're we're no. storytelling ever. <laughs> but are you are you not a Rush fan? Is that the? I, I'm I'm not a Rush fan. No, no. Uh, I, I I respect Rush. I know that they're great musicians. Uh, all my friends have been trying for decades to get me to like Rush. There's there's, there's certain bands, and I, I I'm gonna lose subscribers, but there's certain bands I just don't like. Rush being one of them. Pink Floyd is another. My friend Pete, every time I say that, he grits his teeth. And, and the Grateful Dead. Those are the those are the triumphant of bands. I just I just don't like them. Uh, you know, I like I hear Janis Joplin, and I go, oh god, you, know, you can't stand it. But Ethan did 20 minutes one night on sticks, and ripping sticks to shreds, and I'm like, oh, god, I'm gonna kill him. The um, because I love sticks, I've seen them like three, four times. You're a prog rocker, I am a prog guy. Sorry, see, I, 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 this is the thing that kills me about that term. Everybody says Rush is a prog rock band, blah blah blah. Rush was trying to sound like Zeppelin back in the 70s, yo. Okay, you yeah, always said that uh, that a kid, uh, <laughs> presence is, is Led Zeppelin's Rush album, yeah, sure, yeah. But I mean, you know, um, John's to be out- first album is Zeppelin's fifth album. <laughs> this, this a, the music is a whole other show because man i went to see anthrax i went to see the ramones i went to see all kinds of punk stuff so yeah yep rush is an acquired taste uh Look, i had the weirdest top five bands of, of anybody you know it's like i liked skinner i liked rush you know how different are they and right. they're both in my top five right that's how wide range my music went you know Dude, music. There's there's so many cool things. Did you know that that uh, they used a Rush lyric in a Defenders book? As oh yeah, for Doctor Strange. I think it's uh, Defenders forty five. That was Steve Gerber. Uh, no, was it Steve Gerber or or Friedrich? Friedrich, I think. It, it, it used to awesome. used to put he used to put Super Tramp and Sticks lyrics and Rush lyrics all through the Defenders and Doctor Strange. Yeah, he used Did it you know that, John? Spell. No, no. Yeah, so you I, go. I Defenders yeah. was like the uh, the, like the redheaded stepchild of Marvel. Like, it, it kind of went under the radar. You know, it was just the crazy little comic that that uh, it was hard to get in my in my neighborhood for whatever reason. So, it, I I I didn't get the Defenders until I was an adult. But I, I got the odd Defenders comic, and I never knew what was going on. The theme was always different. The art was always different. And then as an adult, I filled in all the blanks, and I'm like, this was an insane comic. I don't think cool. anybody ever – I don't think anybody writing it knew what was going on for yeah, 10 years. I'm a fan of the TV guy part where the dude came in, the reporter dude or whatever. Dollar Bill. In. Dollar Bill doing a documentary. Yeah, absolutely. I didn't like that part, but um, Defenders 10 – with Hulk and Thor on the cover, was the climax of the Evil Eye crossover between the Avengers and the Defenders. That was the first comic I ever bought. Oh, was yeah. that uh, was that Engelhart? Shit, I don't even know. But yeah, though they did it. They did an eight part. Do you know what we're talking about, John? <laughs> yeah. They, all right. They, so they did an Avengers Defenders crossover, and and it yeah. was about eight parts. And yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah so it was, it's like it if you look awesome. at the music, we're losing those guys too. We lost Neil. Yep. We've lost most of Leonard Skinner, and that's this is how it's going to go. But but at least we we were there at a time when we got to enjoy the best of their work, and and now we can sit back and review the whole catalog forever. Hey, I got to see Randy Rhodes play. I got to see a lot of people. I got to see Eddie Van Halen a few times. I, a lot of these guys that are gone, I got to see. I got to see Neil hit the drums a couple dozen times. Okay. Yep. Um, I didn't miss those things. There are a few. There are a few that I didn't catch that I kicked myself in the ass for. But you know, 
What can you say? Hey, one back in the eighties, I was in the Atlanta airport. We were fogged in. A plane couldn't take off. And uh, there's this guy standing there in the hallway. This is why, you, like John, being in, living working in Manhattan, you you turn around, and you talk to everybody, right? Oh yeah, everybody. Okay. So uh, there's this kid in the elevator. I started up a conversation about chocolate with with some German tourists. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's this kid selling tapes, cassette tapes for five dollars in the airport hallway, and he goes, he goes, "Oh yeah, my my name is Joe, and I wrote this tape. I did all the songs on. It. I'm selling it for five dollars. Helped by a drug abuse. Blah blah. That's my buddy Bo Diddley over there, and I'm selling his tape. And he wanted five dollars. Blah, blah blah. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. That's who? That's who? He goes, oh, that's my buddy Bo Diddley. You want to meet him? Yes. So, so he bring he brings Bo Diddley over, and I get to meet Bo Diddley. And Bo Diddley says to me, he says, uh, he says, so young man, you want to get an ice cream cone? <laughs> I said, it's ten thirty in the morning. Ain't too early for an ice cream cone. Let's go grab one. I'm buying. He's right. I was seventeen. And I got to hang out having an ice cream cone in the Atlanta airport with Bo Diddley. How do you beat that? I, for some reason, that's just been stumbling into stuff and I, I caught the chat by the way i did i saw stevie ray vaughn too i've seen i've been to some some classic shows okay um 78 st paul civic center alice cooper the show got tear gassed it was an why, indoor arena why did they get tear gassed i don't know somebody was being a dick and blew up some tear gas bombs right by the stage oh okay. Cooper and the band are the first ones gone. They're all running away. We're way up in the nosebleeds going, what's going on? Why is everybody running? People are running now, right? People are running, right, to get out of the place. We're way up there in the in the nosebleeds. One of our buddies is in a, in a body cast from neck to his ass, right? Dude can't move very fast. We can't just run out the building. We got to pick him up and carry him. Yeah, we got to bring our bro with us, right? I mean, he's a—he's not a little guy, okay? <laughs> he was a football player, got his neck and a couple of vertebrae fucked up, right? So he's in a body cast, real, you know. But he wasn't a little dude. But we, you know, we had to move slow trying to get out this building where people are trampling each other, running, trying to rush out. You know, it was bad. It was a bad scene, right? Um, I was at the Who concert in Phoenix when uh, John. Mellencamp got hit in the head with the bottle. <laughs> John Entwistle, you mean? No, John Cougar Mellencamp opened oh. for him. They were like, get off the stage! And they started winging and he got hit in the head with a beer bottle. You know, John, you, are you a Metallica fan? Nope. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. So I, Metallica That's another wanted... band I tried. I tried. My friends got... Again, I, I, I'm a punk rocker. You know, I, I my favorite bands are the Beatles, Led Zeppelin, the, the Clash, the Ramones, Captain Beefheart, and, and, and the, you know, Minor Threat and bands like that, you know. Well, I got I got one good Beatles story for you. I my, A friend of mine is uh, is a, a God, what's his name? Tony. And he, I, I'm friends with him on Facebook. We, he used to sell comedy tickets. You know, those guys in Times Square that walk up to you and they go, they go, hey, you like comedy? You like comedy? Yeah, they used to go to comedy clubs. Yeah. 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 The comedy club guys. So his, his hobby was going to meet more people than I could shake a stick at. You know, you hear my stories. And he says to me, he goes, uh, he says, hey, you want to go see Paul McCartney tonight? I said, uh, well, yeah, where's he playing? So he takes me to Grand Central Station. And it was a secret concert. So I got to see McCartney. Nice. And then one, one night we're closing up shop at the ticket agency. And my boss was from Bulgaria. And so he didn't know shit from American music. It, nothing meant anything to him. And it's just the two of us. And he's, we're locking the door as we're leaving. And this fella comes walking down Broadway. Um, <laughs> talk about the cramps. Um, I love the cramps. One of my favorite bands. This, this guy walks down the, uh, is walking down the street wearing a, uh, a pink and white striped coat and big thick glasses. And I looked over at him and I said, I said, um, are, you, uh, are you Peter Noon from Herman's Hermits? And he's talking on his cell phone. He puts his phone down. He says, yes, hello, I'm Pizza Noon. How are you? And I said, oh, man, I, I saw you with Mickey Dolenz. I said, you're great. He goes, oh, thank you very much. He says, you know, I'd stop to talk to you. And he points at his cell phone. He says, but I've got McCartney on the phone. I've got to go and talk to him. I said, uh, okay. <laughs> it's like he, he stopped. Paul, him. I said hi. <laughs> yeah, tell Paul I said hi. I, I, I was at a bar in in uh, in. 
it, it, oh, I can't remember where in Florida, but I was at my friend's grandfather's. My, my, my friend Adam said, let, let, let's go to let's go to Florida. We got a free ticket. We went for a week to Florida to visit his grandmother. And she was a great cook. So we, she just fed us nothing like a Jewish grandmother to, to, to feed you. And uh, we, we went to the same bar down the block every night. And the second night, I'm like, Adam, is that Peter Noon? And he goes, yeah, he looks just like him. So that became the joke. Hey, Peter Noon and over here, Peter. So finally, the, the last night, I'm drunk. I'm like, are you Peter Noon? He's like, yeah, yeah, I'm glad to be. I'm like, okay. I had nothing else to say to him, though, you know? <laughs> I was like, yeah, like, what do you do? You're, 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 yeah, you're Peter Noon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, you got a lovely daughter. Right, Thanks. Thank yeah, you. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, I, well, I, I met I, a bar for like five nights in a row just drinking, not performing. No, I, I saw a show with him and Mickey Dolenz, and they were doing an hour of reminiscing, just sitting on the stage with two guitars and telling old stories. And the stories they were telling were off the charts. You know, Peter Noon talking about touring with the Beatles and and Mickey talking about going to the Troubadour with Alice Cooper and John Lennon. And I'm like, you know, why do you think I went to New York to meet these people? Like, it, this is history. This is legend. I can't meet George Washington. It's too late. Yeah. But I can meet Bo Diddley. I can meet Neil Peart. I, I have to address two comments. First, old, Please. dirty, fatty. I wish I appreciated X when I was younger. Missed out. X is one of my favorite bands. X, I don't know if you know the band X, John Doe, Xeen Savenka. Uh, on Mondays, I, I show off my record collection. It's called Monday Music, and y- you can see all see all the bands that I like. X is one of my favorite bands, hands down. I, I love that band. And then uh, Anthony asks, do, do I like any metal bands? I love Motorhead. I love Black Sabbath. Um, I, I've been... I've been going, I don't know if they're metal or not, but this big business, oh my God, I've been listening to big business. Uh, Freedom Hawk, the Melvins is one of my favorite bands. So you see, I, 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 like, I like metal. Metallica, these guys are great musicians. They're competent musicians, but it sounds like a typewriter. And and Steve yes. Steve Vai is like it has it's soulless to me. The guy's super talented. I just don't like it. And if you like it, fine. I I recognize talent like Rush. I recognize the talent, but I, I, I was going to see Gigi Allen. Like you don't need talent. You, you just gotta have like fire, you know. And like the Cramps, these guys played with out of tune instruments, and you know. The songs never sounded quite the same, and I, I I love that. I was I was a I was a punk rock kid. You know, John, there was there was a club owner that I knew. It was a big he- old old heavy set Italian guy with granny glasses. He used to sit in his office with thirty five cameras in front of him, watching every corner of the nightclub, right? <laughs> and I was talking to him about booking bands when I was a kid. And I said, Man, I, don't know, I was a kid, maybe I was twenty four or something like that, twenty three. And he and I said, I heard you hate booking rock bands. And the guy turns to me. I'll call him Joe. And Joe turns to me and says, listen, kid, I booked every kind of band there is. If the kids want to see a dog piss in a bucket, I'll go rent a bucket and hire a dog. <laughs> I'll so, tell you what, my favorite. We, we need more comic book people like that because they, at least that guy was willing to uh, cater to his audience. You know, yeah. Marvel, Marvel my favorite to, uh, get things, a dog in a bucket. One, one of my favorite things when I worked at Z-Rock, um, the guys from Foghat came through for a <laughs> tour of the studio, right? Lonesome Dave. Lonesome Dave, Dave, yep. Okay. They came into the studio and hung out with us for like two hours talking about just everything. We talked about NASCAR. We talked about all kinds of stuff, right? But um, they were trying to self-place their own music, what genre they were. And I was like, dude, you guys, it's real easy, but you guys, you guys are metal blues. You know, they're, they're rock and roll, man. It's, it's metal blues, man. It's got, it, it, you got some hard stuff, you got some bluesy stuff, but it all fits in that, in that genre. And he goes, I kind of like that industrial blues metal. He said, and I was like, all right, I'll go with that industrial blues metal. That's what Foghat is. And we got a few bands from that era that would fall in that category, you know. Yeah, you know, John, because I w- I'm a prog guy, and because of my age, I, I worked in the early 2000s at a big nightclub called the Higher Ground, uh, which at the time was the busiest nightclub in terms of bookings of any almost any nightclub in the country. We did we did like we were open twenty. It was up in Winooski, Vermont, okay. and uh, in Burlington. 
And they were probably open with national bands 21 nights out of 30. And so the beautiful thing about it was, because I'm sure that the owners thought, oh, God, that guy with his fucking 80s music. But the um, but we I got to see every kind of band there is. I got to see in that club, I got to see uh, the residents. I got to see the Dropkick Murphys several times. I got to see KRS-One. I got to see Ghostface and RZA. I, I got, so you name it, man. I, I do love Prague, but I'm not stuck there. So I, I get it with what you're telling me. I got, I got one Prague Rock album. I got King Crimson Indiscipline, and that's it. Okay. Just recently on our Wednesday show called Still Toking With, we've had uh, Gina Shock from the Go-Go's. We've had uh, Sherry, Sherry Curry from the oh, Runaways. Really? The Runaways, yeah. Dude, we've had some I'm awesome people on, on that show recently from rock and roll, from movies, all kinds of stuff, man. I'm, I'm loving doing this right now. It's, well, it's, I don't have so much fun. It it in, more fun I, than radio. I, I went to bed an hour and a half ago. Yeah, we got we got to let John get his beauty rest. Yeah, I got to get up at four in the morning, so I, I got to go to bed, guys. No, John, thank you for indulging me. Yeah, no problem. I, it was fun. I'll, I'll have you back, you know. You know, I, I, I try to make a priority for people with, with live campaigns. I'm trying to help out people, trying try to get their campaigns out. So, uh, so uh, speaking of which, the Roku campaign is live. Yeah, yes, go ahead. Tell your Roku <laughs> campaign. I backed. I know you did. I appreciate it. Uh, and John, matter of fact, send, send me the link and I'll put it in, in this description to this video tomorrow morning when I wake up. John, let, let, let me see if I can let me see because I won't be able to get in this once I close out. What's up? Let, let me let me see if I can wrap this up by by you know because we're we've been all over the place everything yeah. from uh, ham sandwiches to the Ramones, okay? Yeah. And I think what this is, yeah, well, all New York stuff, but you know stuff that Pops was talking about too. And I think what this is is that you're a person who looks around and says, "What's more interesting than what's going on outside my front door?" And, and back in the, we were kids, you could get that for a quarter. <laughs> Stan Lee would invite you into the world. And this is bigger than your, 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 and, and we took that and we expanded on it to get involved with everything we could absorb. Um, yeah. Am I wrong? No. Nope. Get on. Nope. Nope. Yeah. I, you know, we noticed the piping. Yeah. Yeah. This, this I'm going to say something, get off my lawn kids. You know, that's, that's been a running joke all day pops, but, uh, it's it's a like when we were kids. Like, do you remember just you go outside and you walk into your friend? You just daydreamed for twenty minutes while you walk into your friend's house, or you walk into school. You know the internal mm -hmm. monologue, like Spider Man hanging out there with Luke Skywalker, and, and, the, and then you, you're thinking about that girl that you had the crush on, and then you remember and you, your grandfather and then blah blah. You know, nowadays when you got that, you, you pick up your phone, and, and I really do think that. You know, and again, this is going to sound like old man get off my lawn, but like we 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 don't like daydream and and, and use our imaginations as much as we used to. And I, I wonder if that's why movies suck, if if music sucks and comic books suck, because we have a whole generation of people now grew up like every free moment they got. Beep, 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 beep. Like I remember, Instant gratification is the problem. Know, but, but we don't like. Imagination is is a muscle, you know. It it, it, it it's yeah. a skill. Like my parents would, I'm I'm Irish, I'm Irish and Italian, so I was Catholic on both sides, and I would go to church every Sunday, and I, you know, yeah. and church was prime imagination time. I'm sitting there thinking about Black Bolt and Kiss and, I'm, and, I'm, and Benny Hill, and you know, anything anything but Mass. You know what I mean? I'm but you know, now I can sit there on the phone. Time. We we as fans are really push the creators to get the next thing out instant gratification is a thing not just for the fans but for some of the egos that create stuff too okay instant gratification the quicker i can get it out you know the quicker i can get it out the quicker I can, doesn't always mean the better it's going to be well, I, I think mean, that's what's happening with i, the I don't know so much if i believe that because like we were talking about Charles the movies. Comics, you know i don't you think know, they're trying to give us the best talking out comics you know, no, but those kind of imagination to make interesting comics. Like I, I just think like kids talking about the movies. I think they're really like there's no creativity involved there because the fans well, just not creators. Don't yeah, have creativity, the, you know? the the kids are still doing good stuff. They, you know, today they're all in. They're all in, over here, pops. He, he's, he's they're all into Baldur's Gate three. Well, good for them. Okay, 
and just you can have your Baldur's Gate three, you can have all that stuff, but you got to remember who Tom Mix was. You got to find you got to find out who the Count of Monte Cristo was. Then you know. Then you got the I full waited, range. I waited for Baldur's Gate for all these years, and now I'm like, yeah, I'll wait till they work the bugs out. I'll wait till the price comes down. I'll wait. I'll wait. I waited this. Long. I'm not a video game guy. You know, well, I'm just, I'm just saying that's all this gate is you could have sex with a troll or something. I don't know about none of that. <laughs> <laughs> thank, no, you, thank you, Anthony, for indulging us. You know, I, I, I got, I got, when I saw the news that Keith Giffen died, I got really emotional. And because yes. of that, I, 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 I knew I wasn't going to be able to sleep. I knew Kevin wanted to talk with me. So I figured this would be a good, a good chance to do a spontaneous live unrehearsed talk about a comic great that we love and and it and, and I, I don't know it, it really if you think about it kevin uh this whole talk like you said it's 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 in one way or another it's been a circle around new york you yes. know you know we've been talking about you know even, even though you know well, well kevin lived in new york he knows hey, we, John, talked what about we talked about the borscht belt you know John, RG, what, do you, what, what do you do at a wake yeah you, you, right yeah yeah, an Irish wake, one less drunk, right? <laughs> that, that's what we're doing. This is Keith's. This is Keith's uh, Irish wake. Yeah. Kevin, yeah. Were you at uh, uh, New York Comic Con? I have been there. I was not there. This I have not been in a few years. I, I just wondering because I know that's late. Did you yeah. get hey, hey, pops? Did you see Keith Geffen's obituary? Not yet. No. Here's I what just like, uh, yeah, take it. Take us out with Keith Keith Geffen's obituary. It, this is what Keith Geffen said. I did not write this. Keith Geffen wrote this. Okay. He wrote, I told them I was sick. Anything to not go to New York Comic Con. Thanks, Keith Geffen. Wow. And then he dies. <laughs> wow. Wow. All right, guys. I, before anybody says anything else, I, I got to go because I know Kevin will go, one more thing. And then in 45 minutes from now, we'll like see you in the funny papers. My wife is probably upstairs going, he's never going to wake up in the morning. Yep. Right, bye bye. Bye bye, guys. Thank <laughs> you.